Hello and welcome to a new edition of Hocus Focus. I'm Sarah Mondaini. And I'm Thomas Sheridan. And thanks for joining us and thanks again for the response and support of the previous episode. And I think it's wonderful that the new farm has been such a hit with you guys. And again, like last week, like last month, excuse me, uh, there might be a few more hidden surprises in this edition. So watch out for those in the background because you don't know who might drop in especially with tonight's special subject. And how have you been and what have you been up to since we last got together? Seems like a long time ago now. Yeah, I've been banging out some vans. I've been, I found like piles. I was doing some spring cleaning a few weeks ago and I found piles and piles of notebooks I had from all different projects over the years. So I've just been going through them and, and they've, been, they've been great fodder for building vans. So uh, yeah, I... Other than that, not much else, but yeah, cool. So we've got a lot more bonds to look forward to then. Pro- I'm pretty sure, yeah, a L- lot more. And it's a, uh, it, it's it's a, there were a lot of stuff was uh, was gathered for potentially writing books, but or put into films. But uh, I didn't realise I had such a, a fantastic archive. So putting on the Vaughn kind of like brings it to life. Yeah, I enjoy the Vons on a on a Sunday night, especially listening to it late at night. It gives it another another level. So I've been enjoying them and hope they continue as well, which is one of the reasons why I thought I'd do my new thing on a Friday to keep it well away from the Vons. So it's like a whole a whole weekend of it when they go out all together. That'll be really good. Great stuff. Anyway, guys, we have got a really extra special episode tonight and we've worked really hard on this. And tonight we are going to look into the life, work and legacy of the iconic HP Lovecraft. And we'll discuss all things Lovecraft, his remarkable storytelling, how he was a seer of current times and what he means to us, really. So let's go over to Grandfather Whipple's library where we can talk about all things HP Lovecraft. And I'm going to kick off tonight by talking to you about, well, taking you into the cosmic realm of HP Lovecraft, who is the master of cosmic horror. And I'll give you a brief introduction to him for anyone who isn't familiar. And then I want to talk about what he means to me. Now, how Howard Phillips Lovecraft was an American writer, born on the 20th of August, 1890, in Providence, Rhode Island, and he's best known for his works of horror fiction, especially cosmic horror, which is a subgenre which is identified by the insignificance of humanity when confronted with indifferent cosmic forces. Now, Lovecraft's upbringing was full of tragedy and hardship. His father was a travelling salesman who suffered a mental breakdown, and he was institutionalised when Lovecraft was only three, and he was raised by his mother, and his grandparents and aunts, and he lived quite an isolated childhood. He was frequently ill and struggled with lots of health issues throughout his life. His love for literature and writing developed early on, and he was drawn to the works of Edgar Allan Poe and Lord Dunsany. And he began writing his own stories in his teens, but it wasn't until later in life that he gained recognition as a writer. In the 1920s, he began publishing his most famous works, in pulp magazines such as Weird Tales, and those were stories such as The Call of Cthulhu and At the Mountains of Madness and The Shadow Over Innsmouth, and that introduced readers to this unique brand of cosmic horror and this fictional universe known as the Cthulhu Mythos. But despite his literary talents, he struggled financially throughout his life, and he was often relying on the support of family and friends. But he was a gentleman and he liked to behave like one, and his legacy grew significantly after his death on March the 15th, 1937, at the age of 46. Now, his works posthumously gained recognition, influencing generations of writers and filmmakers and artists, and today he's celebrated as one of the most influential figures in the horror genre, and his stories continue to attract audiences all over the world. He was influenced by Gothic literature, which came up in the 18th century and really got going in the 19th century. And Gothic literature, as we know, has its dark atmospheric settings with supernatural elements and looking into the human psyche. And that inspired Lovecraft in his work. But 
he took his writing in a different direction with this thing that we know as cosmic horror, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Now, he struggled with chronic anxiety and depression throughout his life, which came through in his writing, his themes of psychological horror and existential despair. The stories are full of otherworldly beings, forbidden knowledge, and probably most importantly, the delicateness of human sanity. And his stories are allegories of the anxieties and fears that haunt us all. And his themes of cosmic insignificance are familiar to anyone who's ever felt small and insignificant in the vastness of the universe. Even more so, I think, as we go through these current times. So what is cosmic horror? or Lovecraftian horror, as it's also referred to. The way I look at it is, if it were a roller coaster ride at an amusement park, it would not be one of the old wooden ones with a few dips. It would be one of those big, intimidating, extreme ones with vertical drops and too many corkscrews that require you to be strapped in so you don't get killed. In my opinion, it's a seriously frightening and uncomfortable horror genre, and it covers a number of things. Firstly, the insignificance of humanity. Now, his stories show humanity as this tiny speck in the grand scheme of the universe. And the characters are mainly confronted with the realisation that their existence holds little or no significance in the face of ancient otherworldly beings and cosmic forces and the indifferent nature of the universe. Now, also in his stories, the cosmos is not a benevolent or ordered place but a vast and uncaring expanse filled with ancient otherworldly entities that go way beyond human understanding. And these entities are often known or referred to as the great old ones or elder gods. And they just, in the stories, go beyond the comprehension of our mortal minds. And they're in, they too are indifferent to the struggles and aspirations of humanity. And it also covers existential dread and Lovecraftian horror is filled with this dread in the way that he challenges basic human beliefs and assumptions about the nature of reality. The narrators or the characters struggle with the realisation that the universe is indifferent to human suffering and that their lives are meaningless in the cosmic scale. And we are viewed exactly like we view ants on an anthill. Now it also has inexplicable entities such as ancient gods, cosmic horrors and alien beings, usually tentacled, that go beyond anything that we could ever imagine or anything that we could put into words. And they exist <coughs> beyond the human perception. And yet in his stories, they're always watching us like specimens and they're always right there. And of course, with these entities comes forbidden knowledge or the unknown. And so the protagonists are driven to madness by their pursuit of forbidden knowledge and chasing the unknown and it's the knowledge that exposes the true nature of the universe which reveals to them humanity's insignificance in the face of these cosmic truths that were so insignificant and that there is no good or evil only indifference everything they thought of as reality and all their spiritual beliefs are discovered to be an illusion in the stories now cosmic horror also has a reoccurring theme of isolation and despair where the stories <clears throat> explore themes of alienation and, again, existential despair. Characters are cut off from the comforts of society and left to confront these horrors of the cosmos alone as they slowly realise that their lives are inconsequential. Now, I think there's quite a bit of stuff that would drive anyone to insanity if they discovered it to be true. So, yes, the cosmic horror is not for the faint-hearted. Now, in The Call of Cthulhu, for example, the protagonist uncovers a cult devoted to an ancient cosmic entity known as Cthulhu, whose awakening threatens the stability of the world. And also in the story, at the Mountains of Madness, explorers in Antarctica discover the remnants of an ancient civilization that predates humanity, uncovering the true extent of cosmic history and again the insignificance of human achievements. And it's not just the existence of Lovecraft's otherworldly entities, but the idea that these entities function according to their own logic. They are not malevolent in the human sense, but they are indifferent to human concerns and they exist on the plane of existence that 
in the stories, the characters can even put into words what it is they're seeing. And the thought of this cosmic indifference is what adds an extra layer of dread to these stories. And I think the stories remind us that there are mysteries in the universe way beyond our understanding and that sometimes ignorance can be a form of bliss. Now, his cosmic entities such as Cthulhu and Earth and all his other indifferent cosmic entities just dwarf human existence and represent forces beyond our control. But very often in the stories, it's not the evil entities that pose the greatest threat, but it's our reactions to them. Now, Lovecraft's protagonists, who are very often the narrators of the story, can fight for their sanity as they, are, as they come face to face with the incomprehensible. In the 1917 short story Dagon, the main character is driven to madness by a terrifying encounter. He was working as what's known as a supercargo on a boat when it was taken over by a German sea raider. And he manages to escape in a small ship and he ends up stranded in a strange place that he believes is the sea floor that has risen to the surface due to what he thinks was volcanic activity. Now he meets, or he comes face to face, with a one-eyed tentacle creature that rises to the surface, terrifying him to the point of insanity. And he's eventually rescued by a US ship, and he wakes up in a hospital in San Francisco. Now the narrator knows that nobody will believe what he's just seen. So he goes to seek out a famous ethnologist to discuss the ancient Philistine legend of the fish god known as Dagon. But to his disappointment, he realises that the ethnologist is also too conventional to believe him. And it's at this point that he goes into full insanity. Now, the story has many metaphors and similarities to current times, I think. Protagonist's realisation that there's more to existence than he once thought changes his worldview and spiritual side forever and he's unable to cope with the idea that the creature and the other world that he saw really does exist and that no one would believe him. It wasn't the creature that caused him harm but it was his reaction to it and the need to be safe no matter the cost. Perhaps if he'd accepted the truth he might have stood a chance but he couldn't let go of his old beliefs and that kind of mirrors how many of us felt during the Rona and we discovered that what was unfolding wasn't human and how difficult it was to try and convey that to others who didn't understand or didn't want to look. And we had a choice. We could either let this spiritual force drive us insane or we could get out of the way and focus on our own asses while we, fought, while we found others that were like us. And for me, especially lately, Lovecraft stories have been more than just entertainment. They've been a source of comfort if you like, in these times of uncertainty. And I often turn to his stories for perspective because in Lovecraft's world, the line between sanity and madness is very, very thin. And how you choose to walk along that line is what can save you. And it's in that liminal space that saves us from insanity because if we know something is there, then we can confront our deepest fears and insecurity. And by doing that, you get a glimpse into the abyss and how not to allow yourself to fall into it. And this is how Lovecraft stories have helped me deal with the last three years. And it was because of his portrayal of characters who confront the abyss of the unknown. It shows that human beings must create their own meaning in the universe. And that is the route to your salvation. It's up to us to live meaningful lives within a vast universe, regardless of what the allegorical or metaphoric cosmic horror thrown at us disguised as mainstream narratives and ideals might be. So the importance of H.P. Lovecraft goes far beyond horror fiction. The stories are reflections of the human condition, looking at themes of existential dread and insignificance and the fragility of sanity. And for me, his, his works have been a light in the darkness, helping me find some perspective and to get a grip in these times of uncertainty. So I'll finish off my section with a quote from Lovecraft. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the strongest kind of fear is the fear of the unknown. Now Thomas is an expert on Lovecraft's life and work. And I'm not even going to pretend that I've got as much knowledge or expertise on the man as he does. I simply appreciate the writing, the stories, the allegories and the metaphors and how they've helped me navigate certain situations in life. That is what 
means the most to me about HP Lovecraft. Very good. Um, how many days do we have uh, to, to do? Uh, when you suggested this, I think initially you you wanted to do a while back. You'd mentioned that we do as one of the topics on the old format of Cthulhu, and I was just like, you know, it was way too big, too massive. And I made Libra Providence on the assumption that people already knew about his work. And then I realized that quite a lot of people didn't know about him. So that's kind of what the show could be tonight. If you only know a bit about him or you don't know anything about him, it could be good that way. And so I find everything about his work and him endlessly fascinating. He's one of the most unusual people that ever lived. And also one of the most ordinary people that ever lived in many ways. And uh, I first came across him when I was a kid in one of these books that they used to publish back in the day where they'd have like a paperback with like 20 or so horror stories in it. And it was called like something like, you know, Masters of American Horror or something like that. And Dagon was in that, which you just mentioned. And Dagon's a good introduction to the kind of Cthulhu mythos that he developed uh, because it sets the scene with the concept of the creation between the cosmic gods and the bottom of the ocean and mankind's, you know, inability in coming to terms with this. Not only can we not understand it, but we can't even comprehend most of it. And that's beautifully described in that passage by what he's, you know, he staggers across the landscape of rotted fish under the obligatory gibbous moon. It comes across these hieroglyphics that show that there was, there must have been ancient civilizations on Earth millions of years ago that were capable of doing this, that were before humanity. And this is what shocks him. Now, I think to understand why so many of his protagonist characters, narrators within the stories end up in the state of shock, it's always true a revelation that they discover something about themselves or something about their world or their heritage or something. Now, Lovecraft's family were quite well to do before his father died. They were basically, you know, American Yankee aristocrats. They were they came over from Devon in England on the, you know, practically Mayfair Puritan types, and they were well to do. And whatever caused his father's nervous breakdown. You know, there's, I've heard people say it was maybe it was syphilis and stuff like that. He was on, you know, he, but I, we don't, we just don't know. It could also have been something paranormal, because the more I explored that family, the more interesting they become. His grandfather Whipple was one of the top Freemasons in New England and had an enormous esoteric and occult and philosophical and mythological library that the young. H. Powered Phillips Lovecraft at a very young age was able to tap into. He was reading Greek and the classics by the time he was six or seven. And he was a, one of these kind of like child prodigies. He worshipped his grandfather and he had access to his library. At the same time, too, he was having these nightmares of things called he called the night gaunts. And they went on for years and they were winged creatures, which he described. He points to a Dore wood, a Dore woodcut that shows them a Dore illustration that shows these winged de devil, devil demons and he says they have to rip his stomach a bits every night in a kind of a sleep paralysis thing and then his father dies and then his grandfather dies and that's this is it was a catastrophic loss for him not only do, do the two men in his family the two father the, the two father figures die but also the family then fell basically into poverty because of the way the world was back then. And his mother, Sarah, started, and it's very little spoken about, but I, I was just reading one of the notes there from when I went to Necronomicon in Providence in 2019, that she, she, she was having these visions of these giant creatures following her around Providence. And that's how she ended up in Butler Hospital, like his father. Like the two, just imagine that. His mother and his father both went into psychiatric hospital, Butler Hospital. And I think a huge part of who he was was to avoid himself going in there as well, as if there was a curse on the family or something like this. Now, he had this weird nervous breakdown when he was a teenager that lasted about five or six years. And 
it's never spoken about. No, even the, the, the main biographers haven't got a clue what happened in those years. But he basically was living, this is when his mother went into, into Butler Hospital. Well, he was living with his mother, and then he went to live with a couple of aunts, and uh, basically took care of them. And I believe strongly that he not only had a deep knowledge of the cult, of the occult and magic, which is obvious from his writings, but he actually practiced it. And he found that it was real and something happened. And this is why he embarked on a life of being the professional debunker, not so much debunker, but the, the depressed, the professional atheist, the professional scientist and stuff like that. Now he came out of this, this, uh, this weird reclusive stage and he wrote a satirical essay for the Argosy magazine, making fun of a famous romance night writer at the time. It was so funny and so well written that he was invited to join the United Writers Association of America. And from that point on, he flourished as a human being. You know, he became who he was and later in life. Now, a lot of people have um, a strange notion that he was some kind of morose, weirdo, oddball who hated people. When everyone accounts of people who ever knew him or met him said he was a jolly, funny fellow and he was like great company to be around and extremely likable. Even, you know, people that were like had like professional relationships with him. And he, he, he's because of the political correctness and the woke thing, which amazingly, he's managed to transcend in many ways. I remember about two or three years ago, maybe more, four years ago, there was a concerted effort within, you know, the, the woke media, Vox and all everything to go after him, to portray, you know, they, they were literally calling for his books to be banned. And him to be like, you know, public enemy number one. But then it suddenly just vanished. As if he has this like post-mortal power over them. That, you know, his, his, his work was so good. And, and so well written. I know, yes, people say it's cliched how a lot of stories start off with these kind of like, you know, third person accounts of things that happened and so on. First person accounts. But they're not, they're, they're not dumb they're very very intellectual in fact i think his first professional writing job was writing articles on astronomy for a, a a newspaper in providence he was a very keen astronomer and a very interested in astronomy and that's not surprising a lot of that gets into his work but then when his writing career begins in earnest as you said writing the weird fiction for magazines like uh, weird tales and and so on he he unleashed something from inside himself that was a kind of an oracle. He was a seer in many ways. And he inadvertently, to me, portrayed knowledge that he had, we'll talk about it during the course of the show, I don't want to blow it all now, that in years since, and only in recent decades, has come to into focus in a very interesting way, as if through his grandfather's Whipple's library, he had access to secret documents about the history of America, about uh, not just about the occult, but even, you know, complex ideas of psychoanalysis. Like, I'll give, you, I'll give you a good one. The first book proper I read by him, well, first story by him proper, was The Rats in the Wall. Now, The Rats in the Wall is a story of a guy called Delapore who returns to his ancestral home of Exham Priory in England. And he has some money and he's fixing the house up. This also appears in another story he did called The Moon Bog, about a guy who goes, an Irish American who goes back to Ireland and does something similar. But as this guy is, Delapour, is, is going down into the depths of the restoration of Exham Priory, he is, he is, he is doing a psychic archaeological insight into his own family that the deeper he goes into it and i often think this is if he he knew his grandfather whipple was involved in darker occult stuff than or bigger occult stuff than we know but as he went deeper into the ground he discovers basically that his family were were like cannibals in the past and he goes through all these stages of the archaeological history of exon priory until he reaches like basically a prehistoric location. And it mirrors almost identically 
a dream that Carl Jung had in Switzerland about the same time, about when he had the, uncovered the collective unconscious. So at this, and we, we, if we, we can be basically sure that Lovecraft knew nothing of anything about Carl Jung and his psychoanalysis and his work regarding the collective unconscious. But here he was going into the depths of this at the same time Carl Jung was discovering the, elect, the collective unconscious. And we see that time and time again with his work. Uh, the discovery of the planet Pluto goes in tandem with, with his, his writing. Crowley's last ever magical working took place just across Block Sound from Providence at exactly the same time that, that he was writing Dagon. So his life seems to, his short life before he died of lower intestinal cancer at 46, had this remarkable legacy of not only being the kind of a touch, a psychic and magical and occultic and sort of like, you know, seer type insight into the world around him as he was changing, but also what was to come, like you mentioned the Rona. I don't think I would have been able to rationalize what was going on then without his work helping me. So he, he's never not, he's never not relevant. That's the way I would put him. I like that he invites people to think about the human condition. At the same time, he warns them that the human mind's unable to deal with these horrors that lie beyond our understanding. And his stories always warn about the dangers of going too deeply into the unknown and that some truths are best left undiscovered. And I think, like you do, it might be related to the knowledge that he came across while going through his grandfather Whipple's library now, Whipple was a Freemason and he had, we know he had a massive library. He adored his grandson. And so Lovecraft would have had access to ancient knowledge, occult training and truths that most people have not been privy to reading. And it could be that he discovered things um, that his own mind was unable to cope with. And so to deal with that, he wrote these things in fictional stories to speak of them without the risk of being sent to Butler Hospital. While at the same time, warning others not to venture too far or to be too nosy. And when you think about many of his stories, they're about characters who seek forbidden knowledge or accidentally come across ancient secrets only to be driven to madness by the revelations that these secrets uncover. And I think Lovecraft might have uncovered something or some of these and tried to warn others against the dangers of doing the same by accident. Yeah, he was also... A kind of an affront to modernity. He remained a Victorian gentleman even during the Roaring Twenties and so on. And he, you know, he, he said some very unfashionable things that uh, true stories, such as like you know the horror at Red Hook, that people who bring their from cultures their cultures to other to the New World or to other countries are also bringing their 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 darkness, their demons. They're bringing the the monsters of their own culture with them. And there's a lot of, you know, that was like, I, I don't know anyone who said that. And people say things like, oh, it was just racist. But it wasn't really. He was just pointing out how he felt. And, you know, in the horror at Red Hook, he, that story is so relevant today that when Thomas Malone, the detective, discovers that these kind of hoity toities up in Flatbush Avenue are importing basically slaves as part of a kind of a ritual, you know, a, a kind of a, you know, an occult ritual circle of depravity and everything. Well, that's, isn't that, isn't that like, you know, Epstein's Island? Isn't that, uh, you know, all the things we hear about? The, 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 what do we, we live in a world today where we have these, these bizarre weirdos running the countries who are all degenerates, they're in the hoity-toity, and what are they doing? They're flooding our countries with like uh, people in enormous numbers, uh, you know, of different cultures, and they're bringing their archetypes with them. And there's no, there's not enough time for the two of them to fuse. And what in the horror at Red Hook, what Lovecraft was, was was laying out then is basically the world we live in right now. That you you cannot you cannot have clashes of civilizations and ideologies at the same time too quickly because it will unleash dark forces from below. 
Now, that's called racist. No, it's not. It's called reality. It's called reality. And that's, uh, that's I think that's, that's just one of many examples where he has shown a kind of a, 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 a wisdom, a real wisdom, that's beyond just, you know, like in some way a politician or a philosopher couldn't have shown. It would have took his weird fiction and his cosmic horror to do it, as it was known back then, scientific romances. And that's speaking of another thing, the scientific aspect of it. Although he constantly proclaimed to be an atheist, I think that, like I said, that was a cover story. It had to have been. He, earlier on, he proclaimed he was a pagan and he wrote a beautiful poem about the in praise of the pagans. And he said his heart belonged with the dryads and the nymphs of the ancient classical pagan world. And if you look at how, if you were to approach his mythos, right, one of the reasons that the, 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 the narrators and the protagonists and the main characters in the, in the stories commit suicide or go nuts is because they have a very Abrahamic concept of good and evil, where he was just trying to say that it's only evil because you're being you're you're lower down the food chain. It's just the elder ones, as a tough, you know, the lot rest of them, they're just doing their thing. They're just they're they're part of nature, and you're part of this massive cosmic nature. And if you you know what he's basically saying is that the pagan mind is far more capable of surviving these conflicts with these uh, seemingly impossible beings. And that challenged the notion of God, which is a big, huge thing since the days of flying saucers, like how religion survived if we found aliens. Is he was saying that you know a hundred years ago, if you're pagans, it won't be a problem. And I think in many many ways, the Cthulhu mythos is a kind of a pagan, an emerging pagan mythos of America developing as a world power following World War Two. He did say, actually, that everything since the 18th century he found to be grotesque or um, a caricature of life and that he wanted to live as though it was pre the 18th century. He, he was kind of, he was into the classical world and he also liked the 17th century. And I think that's a very pagan thing because it's just like a lot of people in the tribes today wanting to go back to pre 9-11. Yeah, the, the way of function collapsed thing. Yeah, I mean, he was, you know, he died before Oppenheimer de detonated the atomic bomb. But in many ways, he was kind of like the opening act for that. He was the he was the opening act leading, leading up into that. And he was only known through those magazines. But the amazing thing is, as soon as he died, and because of people like, you know, August Derleth and, and Arkham House Publishing, his fame grew massively and very quickly. Would I mean, could you imagine a world today without him? How many movies that would have never been made without his cosmic horror? Video games, uh, board games, so many things, you know, originated from this, this, this basically this very mundane man from, you know, Providence in Rhode Island. It's, and that's another thing. His relationship with Providence is remarkable. He absolutely loved his hometown. And, and he had turned it into his own magic circle. He turned it into his realm, into his domain. And in very much the same way that James Joyce did with Ulysses and, and Dubliners and books like that, the city, Providence, to Lovecraft, was, was a multidimensional spectral landscape of hauntological, you know, imagination and experience. It, it, it was it was the way he would describe the streets, the way he would describe the buildings and the architecture. He, you know, he when he went to New York, when he married Sonia Green, he absolutely hated New York. And he wasn't even living in Manhattan. He was living in Red Hook in Brooklyn and or in well near there in part of Brooklyn. And um, he, when he, he he was like an umbilical cord was cut and he had to go back to Providence. He had to go there. And return there, and it says on his little tombstone in, in in Swan Point Cemetery, "I am Providence." on on the actual tombstone, he, you'd say to yourself, "Well, Providence back then was a kind of a a, a mid sized city, uh, quite industrial at the time. It was full, filled with railroad yards. 
uh, that connected everything between Boston and New York. It was a, had a busy port, and it, it, it was like, you know, it had lots of factories and stuff like that. But what he did was, in a kind of a chaos magic way, he turned a certain house into a place where a mystical experience happened, or a street, or a road, you know, uh, uh, the docks, this kind of thing. And he filmed, you know, this, what you call this, people would say a bleak landscape of this like industrial New England city. But he didn't, and he did the same with the, the rural hinterlands, you know, like the briar bordered walls of, 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 you know, around Dunwich. And then he invents this compensatory Arkham, which is like this parallel universe of providence, kind of, in which he's allowed to be even more fantastical and even more imaginative. So he, he, he also kind of invented hot ontology as well. I think he was kind of quite switched on for his time, um, just like a lot of us are switched on for our time. Now, his grandfather Whipple was a Freemason and he had access to the library. So I think that Lovecraft knew about or had discovered something about the shadowy unknowns, shall we say. And when you first find out about these things yourself, you know, it does go beyond belief. It beggars belief and you want to tell people not everybody's receptive to the information that you're giving. So I'm wondering, did he discover the shadowy elite, uh, sorry, the shadowy unknowns that are running amok at the moment and he tried to rationalise or understand it or comprehend it better through allegories and metaphors and just like we have to talk about the shadowy unknowns now when we're on YouTube or on other forms of social media, we have to speak in code and in allegories and in metaphors so that we can be understood and not be censored. And I think the censorship of his time was that he was afraid that he might be put into Butler Hospital because people would think he's insane. Because when you think about the last three years, a lot of people think that people like us were insane because we didn't want to go to the Britney Spears concerts at the time. So I'm wondering, was he just a product of his time and the shadowy elites of that time, as we are a product of our time? I don't like calling them the elites, the shadowy unknowns of our time. Yeah. In fact, he hints at this in a couple of stories. He hints at it in two I've mentioned already, the horror Red Hook, the Hoi Polloi up by... Uh, up in Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, and the uh, the esoteric order of Dagon he mentions in the, the shadow of over Innsmouth, and its connection to the March family, the ref, the gold refining family, that when they, that the, that they basically run the town, and here they are, they're they're in, they're, they're inbred with these subaquatic deep ones who are these cosmic beings that live under the ocean, this kind of thing. And you have, well, they live off the, the coast of Innsmouth. And you have that in the Red, Horror Red Hook as well. And you have it in a few other stories where you get this kind of notion that there's, he hints, even within the, the, the you know, the, the, the Call of Cthulhu, the, it, 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 he mentions the Louisiana cults as if to say, you know, are the, are the sort of like, you know, the poor people, the, the poor people involved in the occult are mercilessly exterminated by the federal authorities, as if to say they're not allowed to have it, but the the high poly have it. Like it even begins the uh, the beginning of the shadow over Innsmouth, Innsmouth over you know the the lack of the liberals, the liberal bodies having any concern for what happened to people there. You know, it, it was like the fed, what the federal government did. You know, whatever horror they unleashed upon the people that were living there, and so. Yeah, he, he must have, because his father, or his grandfather Whipple, wasn't just a Freemason, he was a super Freemason. He, he, he opened something like 20 or 30 Masonic lodges in Vermont, in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, all around that area. Uh, he was, a, he was a, like a, you know, a granddaddy, big shot Freemason. So I, I think so, and I think a lot of historical mysteries, which we'll talk about in other parts of the program, he was aware of, a, a well, you know, this America BC thing. I think he knew about that. And I think his the story he wrote with Harry Houdini under the pyramids, 
it was like here he is writing about like Egyptian mysteries that it wasn't until, you know, the last 30 or 40 years that that stuff came out into the open that the, that the pyramids and the, the, the things are far more strange and mysterious than just the archaeological ruins. Yeah, I think he discovered some truths with a capital T rather than truths with a double O F. And that was his way of dealing with it and maybe passing the message on to other people, speaking in allegory and metaphor, just like we have to do today. Yeah, and a, and a constant all through his work is that there's an older work civilization, whether it's in the, you know, the, the mountains of Madness and the Antarctica. And again, look at where you look, look, just think of at, at the mountains of madness and what the story is about, right? The these the Arkham University sending down two plane loads of scientists to 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 go into parts of the, the, the place to do a biological and geological survey and they discover an ancient city. Now uh here we are. You know, as the, so much of the forty ant today is about I mean Joe Rogan's constantly going on about the mysteries of Antarctica with uh, you know Graham Hancock. And again one more thing like did he know something? Did he know had he heard stories through his grandfather that is something we did a show on our on our Antarctica? Is was there something more going? This is this is a remarkable thing. He was you associate you hear the term cosmic horror, and then you think like, well, it's all to do with space and everything, right? But it's not. There's only one story he ever wrote that takes pl place on another planet. Everything else is the relationship between the human experience. And these outer gods, these outer beings. So as if to say, you know, all the things that became popular much, much later on, he seems to have been, had, had in, you know, inside knowledge of 100 years ago. Did he know about the globalist agenda back then? Because that globalist agenda is hundreds of years old. There's been planning that for hundreds of years. Did he know about that? Did he know about all the things or did he get... The root were there rumors about what was coming going to be coming over the next two hundred years, and we know there are things out there just below the surface of human consciousness that swept through the planet over the last three years. Did he know that as well? The same would call, the same people or the normies, if you like, would call that delusional, yeah. and they'd be driven to insanity themselves if any of that knowledge was revealed. Plus, you yeah. can be fine. You can, you know yourself. You can be fine one day. Read something on the internet or in the news, and that can literally be so shocking, or or just bring down your perception or the illusion that you've been living in, and it can bring on literally bring on an existential crisis the next day. And there's many truthers or truth seekers, um, serious ones, not not you know who don't take a break. And they just seem to be living one existential crisis. And the way they cope with it is to post as much doom and gloom as possible in the hopes that you'll eventually feel as hopeless and paranoid as they do. Now, maybe Lovecraft discovered some information and some knowledge because he suffered from depression and anxiety too. So maybe it got into his head and he didn't know how to deal with it. And rather than, you know, to spread doom and gloom everywhere and to risk being put into Butler Hospital, the way he coped with it was to put it into story form and fiction form and allegory and metaphor so that he could kind of warn people without actually saying it out loud, if that makes sense. In the 1984, they say he was a seer. He wasn't a seer. He just knew what was coming down the road. So he had that information and was able to write that story. So maybe a lot of Lovecraft's stories rather than just give you the information in a cold rational way you get it you get it in this allegory and metaphor because the powers are the shadowy unknowns they they are very evil and they have no no regard for human life they just do what they do yeah and he had this he was spectacularly original you look at his influences they were like Lord Dunsany who wrote basically kind of like fairy stories, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, but it, other than the outside, that none of the stories are anything like Poe stories, even though he was great and, uh, you know, inspired by him. And maybe it, it, it is the weirdest he would get would probably be something like Arthur Mackin and, you know, 
The Great God Pan, which is it's a weird book anyway, but that had been as weird as it would have gotten. And he just un- launches this whole other thing from inside himself, which I find remarkable. And he often said that he wondered if he really was coming up with these stories or if they were, because so many of them used to, so many of the things he wrote about and the, the ideas and the stories he created came from dreams. He called them the phantasms of his nocturnal slumbers. And he wondered if I have a right to actually claim these as my own, or am I being fed information from outside? Now, I know those of us, and I say tribe-minded people, or people who have gone down this road, we have. We value our intuition very highly, uh, because we do, I, I mean, we do have insights just before we wake up from dreaming and stuff like that. We do have dreams where things come to pass. We do make predictions based on some unknown, you know, insight that comes into our skulls. He, 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 I think he was a, I think he was like an oracle in many ways. That in the same way we can be automatically suspicious. Like you said about existential crisis when someone finds something out. The, the normies as they are right now, they, they, they're they not even ready to accept that the Britney Spears concert didn't work, let alone anything else, right? Let a, uh, But if we were to suddenly put them down and tell them what we know about these these things, it, w- it would just, it would destroy them. It would destroy them. We'd be like their Cthulhu, you know? We'd be like that, you know? And, uh, and he, I, I often wonder if, the gods, whatever, picked him to help us negotiate through the world following, say, the Great Depression. You know, he got he, he, he got people's minds ready. You know, he was he was a prophet and a seer himself, but the message wasn't for his time. It was for the atomic age. It was for the space age. It was to get us ready that to the point where we're at now, where the U.S. government have guys on Tucker Carlson saying, yeah, we recovered bodies of alien beings. Ironically, that were found in the 1930s in Italy. Uh, and that's, you know, from this, this craft that whatever, and saying things like, we're not even sure if they're from other planets. We think they might be from other dimensions. And, and you know, here we are. We're there. You know, and there's the element of like Rosemary Allen Guiley in her book, The Benchville Gin, lavishes lots of praise upon Lovecraft and his ability to foresee the future before it happens and to, you know, remember it like the whole, you know, the Necronomicon myth comes from the Arab world, you know, from the mad Arab. And that's, a, you know, this is just another thing again. He goes in every direction and spools things in. And if you look at the world we live in today, it is kind, you know, post 9-11, it is almost like a conflict between the Arabic world mysticism and the Western mysticism, almost, at that kind of subconscious level. And that was another thing he came up with. You know, why, you know, it's just amazing. It's just, it's like there's never been anyone like him, and yet it was a guy who barely left the street, you know, it's in, in Providence. I just want to go back to this um, existential dread on the normies. Now we we know the main fears of of that are death, meaninglessness, isolation, and freedom, and he describes these as an inescapable part of being human, and that every person must come to terms with these concerns. Now he had anxiety issues and he suffered from depression, so I do think that his stories were his way of dealing with those and exercise, exercising the demons within himself through his creative writing. Like you said, the ideas first came through the subconscious mind, through the bad dreams and the nightmares that he had. He turned those into stories to externalise them. Now, when you look up the definition of an existential crisis, it's, de- it's defined as an inner conflict due to the thought that life lacks meaning and it brings about stress, anxiety, despair and depression and it can disturb a person's normal functioning in everyday life now Lovecraft suffered with all those things and the most 
common approach to resolving an existential crisis is all about addressing this inner conflict within yourself and finding new sources of meaning in life. So did Lovecraft have an existential crisis perhaps after the death, maybe the death of his father and his grandfather? I mean, I I know I had one during the Rona when I realised that life and reality had changed forever. I felt miserable and sad and hopeless. And then actually it was through your car vlogs and managed to turn it around. And I've actually changed as a person completely now. I'm no longer attached to social norms, I'm more creative, <clears throat> I'm more comfortable in who I am. I created this channel, we've co wrote a book, and I started a blog. And when you think about it, that is how I coped with the ex- ex- existential fear that I had when the nature of reality changed for me over the last three years. So many others also did the same as well. And I think that's very similar to how Lovecraft coped with his existential crisis through his writing. He went into himself. He became a recluse. He was a little bit misunderstood, like most of us are. But his inner world got him through. And he wrote about his fears and the knowledge that he discovered through his stories. And how many people now include, and I'm including myself in this, speaking metaphor and allegory to express the forces that we're dealing with on this planet. And why is that? Well, apart from getting around the censorship issues of today, I think it's because, because like in Lovecraft stories, there isn't a way to describe what we're dealing with in human terms. So we use the metaphor and allegory. And in that way, we allow symbols and memes now today to illustrate narratives which are so alien to us we have to put it in a meme to highlight to others that something isn't right. It's a survival mechanism. It's a survival mechanism in many, many ways uh, because when things like that strike, you realise how small you are. And the best thing to do is understand how small you are and accept it. And then from that, and you work your way through it, you will have that creative recovery on the other side. It's very common. That's why people have had cancer. When the cancer ends, they, or even when they're very sick, where all they want to do is paint and draw and write and that kind of thing. It shouldn't. It's a shame that it has to be that, but that's how it is. He was also aware of the Renfielding thing as well. It at the beginning of the the Call of Cthulhu, he has the narrator has the newspaper clipping ser- service. Uh, bits that he collected regarding these strange behaviors all over the world happening at the same time this young artist was having it in the university at the college in Providence and he talks about you know strange things happening in the west of Ireland weird things happening in this the place that place strange cults in blah 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 uh, a man behaving and what he was talking about was the collective unconscious and the Renfields that's what the young artist, the sensitive young artist, who goes into the kind of the melancholy uh, and then suddenly recovers, he was Renfielding what was happening in the South Pacific. And that was, to me, an enormous help to me growing up because it made me realise why people like normies and NPCs would behave in a certain way, a flare-up that before something happened in the world, you know, and uh, he, he definitely knew about that. Now, that wasn't, you know, remember, like, when he, when, he, when he was born, the airplane hadn't even been invented, right? And by the time he died, uh, the, the atomic age was, he was in, in development, and he lived through the creation of things like quantum physics, I mean, in the dreams in the witch house story, he talks about, you know, that you'd need quantum physics. He even warned us about, you know, you know, stepping outside the world of non-Euclidean geometry and using it for the occult. You have no control over it. And here, and here we are today talking about AI and quantum computers. And basically what he was describing was the same thing in the dreams in the witch house. You know, the sagging roof and the building that was made of strange angles and strange shapes that affected consciousness 
in a way that a human couldn't grasp because it, it, it was a different thinking, a different way of doing it. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's why I'm almost evangelical about his work because there's so much wisdom there and there's so much real life practical things. Now, when I went to Necronomicon in Providence in 2019, I got none of this. Now, I'm sure there were people there that were tuned in like the same way I would have been, but the majority were not. And uh, frighteningly so, I might add. They were just incredibly dull. And I, I, some, of the, some of the lectures I went to, I was like, well, what is this crap? You know, like, what am I watching here? And it was like people who clearly were like educated NPCs that had never had a spiritual experience, didn't even fully understand its ontology. They just thought it was like, man, you know, you know, the case of Charles Dexter Ward. That was just imagination, you know, just an imagination. They just didn't seem to understand that this imagination, these insights come from very, very deep places that cannot be explained. You know, with rational language in the same way that the outer gods and, you know, the old gods, the old ones have names and languages that no, the human vocal cord can't express, hence the spelling of Cthulhu. I'm in a few, I don't know if you may be in the same ones, but I'm in a few groups on Facebook regarding HP Lovecraft. And I've got to say, the majority of the posts are quite dull and there's a lot of arguing about what things mean and what things are about and who knows the most and who's the most academic regarding the subject. Yeah, and, and I do often atheistic, think, switch the atheistic. computer off and go and read a story, read one of his stories because you're talking out, you're just talking out of your backside. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, they just don't seem to understand anything, you know, like they, they call people, you know, I, I remember getting into an argument once about Simon's Necronomicon and there was some like one of those kind of like, you know, self-professed academics that you've been talking about. And um, he was saying, oh, it's just garbage. And I says, how, he said, how would that work? It was only written in the 1970s. And I was like, you don't seem to understand. It's a transfer. And I was trying to explain to him that the concept of consciousness being wrapped around symbols and archetypes that can be, that can be charged in certain directions, uh, you know, the, the universal memes and he was like it's just nuts it's just crazy it's just nuts and i was genuinely trying to have an a, a, a respectable cordial debate with them but they were all like that like they, they they flew you know they flew two people over for necronomicon from england from the some university in, in like cambridge in england or oxford or somewhere and one of them was a professor of literature and the other one was like a professor of social studies or something and they, they stood on the stage and all they said was, and this is literally the entire quote of what they said during the whole event. He was, in, he was a racist because of the neoclassical architecture in Providence was very similar to the Third Reich's architecture. And I'm sitting there going, these people are nut jobs. Yeah. I, what can you say? They, they, it's almost like they don't really enjoy the stories. They just enjoy telling you how much they know about the stories or how much they know about what they think the stories mean and what how how far into his head they think they can get and explain what they think he means. And I don't know about yourself, Thomas, but it kind of puts me off. I, I don't really need some <clears throat> self-professed intellectual to tell me how to enjoy a story or how to understand it. Do you know what I mean? Because stories mean different things to different people. Well, the same thing happened in lots of things in recent years like that and the leading up to the world. Discordia, I mean, they're all, it's all full of these, like, you know, you know, these sort of, like, obnoxious sort of, like, middle-class types, you know, single men in their 40s, who not a woman in sight, but they're, they're really smarmy and snotty and everything. And the things that come out are such bullshit. If Robert Anton Wilson was alive today, he'd, he'd absolutely hate them. And yet, here, here they are thinking they're like managing his legacy, and they could think it was like that famous scene in Annie Hall, the Woody Allen film, where there's a there's a couple talking about a, a writer's work on the on the, the movie theater line, 
and he says, uh, you don't have a, Woody Allen goes, you don't know what you're talking about. And uh, as I prove it to you, I'll go get the author. And he pulls the famous guy, famous guy that over to the couple. And the guy goes, you haven't got a clue what my work is about. And I, I felt like I wish there was someone like that. I, I wish I could bring Robin, Robert Anton Linson or, uh, you know, Lovecraft or someone like that, you know, August Thurlitt back from the dead to actually confront these people. What makes me laugh about these people is we know people in the tribe know that over the last three years we've literally gone through a cosmic horror of sorts and we've come through it and we're still we're still vertical we're still standing we didn't acquiesce to anything yet a lot of these intellectuals who think they know all about the mythos and all about what lovecraft meant between the lines all ran and queued up with the sleeves rolled up and couldn't get the Britney Spears concert tickets fast enough so they all acquiesced to the cosmic horror that was so blatantly obvious. Yeah, I can even remember when I was talking about it back in the early days of the Rowan Chronicles, and H.P. Lovecraft is one of the regulars on our channels, uh, the chap who calls himself that name, and he even pointed out, like, Lovecraft never mentioned what size the, 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 the old ones were, and they could have been the size of a virus, you know? And I found that, wow, that, that, you know, that was the kind of discussion I like to have, you know. But no, no, they're all sitting at home, keep maintaining, you know. It's it's amazing, you know. It's one of the. It's I hate to say, I don't want to say wheat from the shaft because that the shaft because that has an elitist connotation to it, you know. I'm better than others, but it's like I feel like grabbing them and saying, "Can you not just look a bit below the surface, you know?" You're, you you will enjoy it immensely more. No, 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 no. Purely academic. And he most certainly wasn't like that. He he understood that you could be academic. I'm academic in many ways. And also in the world of woo. Just like, you know, I, Sir Isaac Newton was, you know. He was an alchemist and a, you know, he wrote the Principia Mathematica, which is the, the whole concept of Western science is based upon until the discovery of quantum physics. Yeah, woo and academia are not mutually exclusive, are they? You can have a foot in each and still be quite a rational person, very open-minded. Yeah, I mean, um, like yeah. Oppenheimer and, you know, Hindu mysticism. These people that are keeping the legacy going are probably the type of people or the, the, the type of character that, that would be the first to go insane, just like the, the narrator's in Lovecraft stories, like the protagonists in the stories, they would be the first to go insane at the first sniff of something not being as it's perceived to be in reality. Yeah, they read stories all about the the, the supernatural world, but yet don't believe in it. I just find yeah. like, okay, if you, even if you don't believe in it, you should love it. It's just that they're, they're hardcore reductionist atheists. It's all, you know, and they keep referring back to, you see, they, they can't even grasp the concept that that Lovecraft was probably pushing the atheist thing as a very public way. Remember, he wrote The Cancer Superstition with, with Harry Houdini in a very public way because look at the stakes he was playing against. You don't think those doctors in Butler Hospital and those people there weren't, weren't, looking, at, <clears throat> weren't looking at his family? History, you know, the, is, it, you know, if he had a breakdown and his, if one of his aunts took him down there, he would have been committed for the rest of his life. You know, be, uh, he, and he was having genuine mystical experiences, probably. And I also do believe he practiced the occult. There's no way, there's no way in hell that he could have that depth and insight to produce something like the Necronomicon. Not just in terms of its, its its mythos, but in terms of its workability, it's it's it, you know this this is a, a this is this is the kind of thing that comes from when we do the movie movie review. I'll explain it a little bit better, and it, it, when we get to the movie review. But there's that's key to what I really want to talk about here. That it was only by working in the occult and certain things happening that made that would give you the knowledge to write about it in the way he does you know 
you know, like he he writes about it not in a a newspaper reporter or a magazine columnist writing about how a building was designed or something. It was the, it was like as if the architect himself had written the, the article. It was it's too it's too first hand experiential. Excuse me. Did you see that then? That no. Oh, I'm just trees. What that was. Weird. Right. Anyway, yes. And with the protagonists in the stories that he writes about, is it any wonder that the, they actually go mad in the story when they discover how insignificant human life is? Now, yeah. I, I won't cope very well if I discovered that we were isolated in the cosmos and the cosmos was full of huge entities or small entities the size of viruses that pass by with no regard for us and destroy us, not because they're evil, but because it's just what they do. It's just business as usual. And we're like an ant infestation to them. So imagine discovering that and being expected to continue through life as if all's well. I, I won't be able to, to do it, I don't think. Um, I don't know. It It is... It's a frightening genre. I know we've gone through a, t- a kind of cosmic horror with the last three years and we've come through it, but I'm talking about coming face to face with a, a 20 foot tentacled thing in the sky. I just, yeah, I can understand why they go crazy. And, and the, the only choice you'd have is to accept it and be indifferent to it and stay out of its way. What a genre. I mean, it's as grim as it gets, the genre of cosmic horror. You can't, but you can't stop reading them once you start because you really want to see how bad it gets. And deep down, you're hoping that there'll be a way out for the protagonist. Because in most horror genres, supernatural horror genres, you've got good and evil, and the good usually prevail. And it's you know, it's usually the spiritual faith that saves them. But in cosmic horror, there's none of that. And the only way to stay safe is to get out of the way and not get involved with whatever force or entities in the story. And that, to me, yeah. is the ultimate. That is pretty frightening and pretty isolated. Like, it's, it's yeah, it's not but comfortable the, watching. There's another way of looking at it, though. Was he writing self-help books, in a way? Uh, because... Okay, you discover that you're you're an infinitesimal entity organism in a cosmos made up of like interdimensional subtle demons who, you know, work through human consciousness and dreams and stuff. Get on with your life. That's what he's telling us. Because if you think too deep, that's what happened to him. He discovered that the ultimate secret. Get on with your life and be creative and and and, and make. In fact, in the shadow of over insmount. What the, the the what happens at the end is he he comes to accept his fate as being one of the deep ones, and he is in his mountain, and he ends up swimming below Devil's Reef in a a kind of an, a subaquatic dream state, and it's almost kind of beautiful how it ends for in that story. So you know, even though he goes through the horrors, but of like doesn't want to accept what he is, you know. But th- this is. This is the whole. Thing. I think he's writing warnings against not thinking, like in you know, in, in from beyond, the whole thing of like you know, yeah, okay, you discover this, but then get on with your life. Yeah, you know, and I I think that's one of the reasons he had a big problem with religion. If you believe that the only possibility could be a big, you know, Jehovah in the clouds. And then he discovered that, like, God is this interdimensional daemon sultan at the center of all chaos. Yeah, that will blow your mind because suddenly they've taken God from But if you have this thing like you remain, well, okay, that's how it is now. And I'll just continue on. And uh, so, the you know, you can take them two ways. You know, suicide manuals or self-help books. Which is kind of like a, a good way to describe modern life in many ways, when you think about it. But he's right, though. You discovered it. Get on with your life. Because even before you discovered it, it was still the truth. You just didn't know about it. Yeah. So Exactly, yeah. There's nothing you can do. You can't fight it. Yeah. Just stay out of the way, really. 
and earlier I likened I likened it to uh, I likened the whole genre to an extreme ride on an amusement park. You know the one with the big vertical drops that just make you feel sick before you've even got on it. But the idea of it and the thrill of the unknown just makes people want to ride it, even though it looks terrifying. And that's how it is with the cosmic horror genre. Yeah, he seems to have a had a great respect for discipline as well, like Thomas Malone and the. The hard red hook. He he's he's writes very sympathetically to this copper, you know, even though he's been left messed up by what happened, he continues to to live his life and be diligent to his job. And you see that in a few things, you know. It's like it, it seems to be that everybody in the story seems to have a kind of a heroic quest. And then they discover that they're, you know, the, the, the nature of the reality is not what they thought it was. And they fall apart, you know. But he's also kind of saying, like, what, why did you do that? You know, what, you know why, why did you kill yourself? Why did you, why did you go in, into an insane asylum? You just accept it and move on. And I think that's what happened to him in those, those missing five years. I think he went through that, possibly by uh, something in the occult that went wrong. That he was involved with, and uh, he, he, after five years, he came out and wrote that satire for Argosy magazine. And he just realized, well, that's the meaning of life: just create, live it, enjoy it, if you can. And he saw wonder in on normal things, like he would describe the architecture of Providence, which nothing's particularly amazing, but he would describe it in such a way that it was like it brought him great pleasure to see a beautifully designed building you know that kind of thing and that that's like the self-help part of his of his story as well you know uh, and the, the way Innsmouth is decaying as the genetic uh, the genetic makeup of the town is decaying I thought was fantastic you know like that the way that was described like you know as a, very much the as above so below thing you know the hermetic principles which again eastern mysticism showing up in his, his stories so that concludes our first section on hp lovecraft and what he means to us what does he mean to you the metaphors and allegories in his stories are apparent and can be related to any number of situations where the unknown is concerned or where we find ourselves facing the realization that things are not what they seem we're curious to know the situations that love lovecraft stories have helped you navigate which is your favourite story by him and why. And if you're new to Lovecraft and are considering reading some of his work, then this edition of Hocus Focus might have inspired you to pick up a story. Maybe Lovecraft is special to you for a different reason. So let us know what Lovecraft means to you in the comments. The town of Wilbraham is located in Hamden County and today is considered a suburb of the city of Springfield, Massachusetts. The name of Wilbraham comes from Sir Thomas Wilbraham, a baronet who was an anti-Puritan in nature and who was determined to keep the town unravaged by the hysteria and witch trials which beset towns such as Salem, also located in Massachusetts. A town kept safe from sorceries and the shadow arts is ironically also a blank canvas waiting for the darkest occultists to prey upon the most innocent of lambs. In 1957, even rational and liberal Wilbraham could not escape being lured into the world of H.P. Lovecraft when Lovecraft's biographer and custodian of his heritage, August Derlis, published a story entitled the Peabody Heritage as one of his posthumous collaborations with the Seer of Providence. The story tells of a member of the Peabody clan who returns to claim his large ancestral estate northeast of Wilbraham, Massachusetts, only to 
who unwittingly enable his diabolical ancestor to resume the career of evil, interrupted inconveniently by his death 23 years earlier. The Peabody heritage tells the story from the point of view of an unnamed great-grandson of Asa Peabody, who following his own parents' sudden death, retires from the practice of law and decides to live in the family ancestral Peabody Mansion in Wilbraham, only to find himself unwittingly enabling great-grandfather Asap to resume the career of evil from beyond the mortal realms. For Asap Peabody was a warlock who was required by the dark powers he serves to commit the murder of a child or some other homicidal act of sorcery at regular intervals. Asap Peabody died in 1907 and returns to life after his upside down bones are righted by his great grandson in 1930. The Peabody's diabolical reputation began with Asap's ancestor Jebediah Peabody, who built the Peabody estate in 1787 after relocating from Salem, and it was Jebediah who, the primary warlock of the family, and was the ancestor in spiritual form, who inducted Asap into the Peabody heritage, in the same way Asap, within the story, instructs the narrator to do the same. It soon becomes clear that the family had fled from the Puritans at Salem, so they could practice their dark magic in the relative safety of liberal and naive Wilbraham. The young Peabody, upon arriving in Wilbraham, finds the locals to be cagey and unfriendly. The family mausoleum is then opened, and Peabody finds Asap in an upside-down position in his broken, open coffin. Peabody turns him over and restores Asap to life. A secret room is then found in the house, with a burnt-looking desk and with cabalistic symbols written on the floor. There are books of occultic arts and magic scattered everywhere. At the same time, young, young Peabody is plagued by dreams of Asap and a big black flying cat named Balar moving around the estate at night. Also during these nocturnal visions, he encounters an entity called the Black Man and describes the supernatural being as a man of such vivid blackness as to be literally darker than night, but with flaming eyes which seem to be of living fire. Although it is not mentioned in the text, he is encountering the shadow form taken by Narya Lapotep of the Cthulhu mythos. Narya Lapotep, who serves the cults of the outer gods, uses human languages. Narya Lapotep delights in cruelty and is deceptive and manipulative of humans. Soon the children of Wilbraham go missing and sacrifices are made. Wilbraham, within the Lovecraftian mythos, serves to remind us that the supernaturalism of the world can still infiltrate a community which attempts to build itself upon tolerance and common sense. Yet, within this rationality, a perfect hunting ground is found, as unlike witch-haunted Harkham of briar-bordered Dunwich, the prey is oblivious to the predatory sorcerers.
For this week's folk horror, we are reviewing the 2019 cinema adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's The Colour Out of Space, directed by Richard Stanley and starring Nicolas Cage. Now, Lovecraft originally wrote the tale in 1927 and it covers the usual theme of cosmic horror, existential dread and the fragility of humans in the face of the unknown. And the film is about the Gardner family who've moved to their late grandfather's secluded farm in rural New England. And their peaceful existence is, of course, shattered when a pink glowing meteorite crashes onto their property, bringing with it a mysterious and malevolent force known as the colour. Now, strange activity begins around the meteorite and eventually it disappears. A hydralist named Ward Phillip who is also the narrator of the story, is in the area because he's surveying it for a, a new dam and the water starts to become contaminated. And so when he does the tests on the water, the strips that he uses start to glow pink. Now the family drinks the water and they become contaminated too and strange plant life and animals appear on the farm as well as voices from inside the water well. Space, time and reality are also affected and the family slowly starts to descend into madness as this colour starts to decimate the farm. Now Ward Phillip tries to rescue the family but all he can do is look on in horror at what is happening. As space, time is affected by this colour, he has a vision that the colour came from a planet inhabited by tentacled entities and the only choice this guy has is to hide, stay out of the way and let this thing do what it's doing before he can escape in one piece. Now one scene that stood out for me was when the colour rose up and struck the mother and her son and they, they actually fused together and it was a really disturbing scene that seemed to go on forever. And again, due to the nature of cosmic horror and the fact that you've got to know this nice, quiet family, all you can do is sit there and look in disbelief at what the hell is going on here. And that scene was a real jaw dropper and it's not for anyone of a delicate disposition. And it's at this point in the film that Nicolas Cage goes from being the loving, caring family man into true Nicolas Cage crazy as his character completely loses his mind. And as the colour begins to infect the land and the plants, animals and the family members themselves, all the gardeners, one by one, descend into madness and despair. And they're all struggling with forces beyond their understanding or comprehension. Throughout the film, which I quite liked, there are also lots of homages to H.P. Lovecraft. The daughter, Lavina, in this story, in this adaptation, is a Wiccan who has a copy of the Necronomicon, which was a fictional invention by H.P. Lovecraft and was first mentioned in the 1924 short story, The Hound. Now, in 1977, as Thomas mentioned earlier, a pseudonymous author called Simon published a book by the same name, and that's the book used by Lavina during her final ritual in the film. And in Lovecraft's stories, the Necronomicon is a grimoire written by the fictional Abdul al Hazarad, the Mad Arab, and it contains the secret past of the human race and a study of ancient races such as the great old ones and the outer gods who ruled the planet over a million years ago. And it also contains spells necessary to open portals and cause their return. Now, other homages were the weather report playing on the television while Lavina was washing the dishes. It mentions Arkham, Innsmouth, Dunwich and Kingsport, which are all towns from various Lovecraft stories. And Lavinia also asks her brother, about a former girlfriend from Aylesbury, which is another town in the Lovecraft mythos. And you might have noticed that the narrator's name is Ward Phillips. Howard Ward Phillips, as we know, is Lovecraft's first name, H.P. Lovecraft, Howard Ward Phillips. And um, he's also wearing a sweatshirt from the Miskatonic University, which is mentioned in various Lovecraft stories. Now, I enjoyed this film a lot, and as an adaptation, I think it worked very well and I liked all the characters, even the Wiccan daughter grows on you in the end. And I give this film a 9 out of 10. It's a good length and it's a slow burn in order for you to get to know the family. And once things start happening, you really start to feel for these characters. 
it's a typical horror film with a family pet dog as well. And as soon as I saw the dog, the first thing that I thought was, oh, God, I hope the dog's going to be all right. <laughs> and if you like Lovecraft stories, I don't think you're going to be disappointed with this movie. I, uh, I I liked it very much the first time I saw it, and I loved it the second time watching it for Focus Focus. Now, it's still amazing to this date, there has not been a movie made that's faithful to Lovecraft stories. The Colour Hour Space is close, but it's really based on rather than a, a direct telling. I don't know why that hasn't happened. But having said that, it's a good reimagining of the story. The character of Lavinia, I thought was brilliant. I thought that was a brilliant addition. And Amanda Radcliffe, who was the ma the magical occult advisor to the film, I've interviewed her on Beyond 313. And uh, the use, uh, when Ward Phillips encounters her first at the lake, She's doing it, what looks, I think it looks like a um, a golden dawn ritual. And he asks her if it was Wiccan or Mesopotamian. And she kind of like, she takes a shine to him then from that point on. But there's a darker element to that. Because she, the film suggests when we see later on, we don't see her doing any of the rituals from the Simon Necronomicon but it's on her bed in her room. She does it later, but not the beginning. And she seems to be in a state of um, panic to try and shut the portal down. You start to realize that this wasn't, this meteor didn't accidentally land there. She had summoned it. She had been doing by the lake earlier, uh, Al-Rez, you know, the Mad Arab Necronomicon, al Hazred rituals and summoned this meteorite through and she by that time in the film she had figured out because she said get me out of this place that's what she was saying when she was doing the golden dawn ritual that she had she had brought this on the family it was her fault now not directly she didn't want that but she obviously opened the gate now a thing they left out in the film that's in the book that's important and this shows up time and time again in Lovecraft's stories is there is a megalith a pre-Indian megalith on the, a lake in the island where in ancient times people would call down the old gods from the cold cosmic gods. So that wasn't shown in the film, but it is in the book, which, which is not in the book. That does suggest that this, where the gardener farm is, is a site, it's, it's necromantic, uh, not romantic, uh, geomantically, uh, like Sentinel Hill at the, at the, up on the Dunwich Horror there's a megalith there too as well it exists in real life it's actually in a place called Heath in Massachusetts and she called the thing down and that part later on the film where she gets the neck and armor come out she's frantically trying to close the ritual she left open and at the very end of the film she's caught, she's the one who's brought up into the stars she's the one she that she she does get out of this place the colour transports her back into the cosmic uh, domains from which she had called down the thing. Now, I thought that was a fantastic interjection into the original Lovecraft story. It was a very clever thing, using a lot of like old-fashioned kind of Hollywood-like storytelling tricks. But boy, God, did it work. And uh, it's a very tragic film. That, that scene where the mother and the son are grafted together is almost impossible to watch. It's probably one of the most harrowing scenes I've ever seen in any movie. It's just, and the noises she makes and everything, and the child, and uh, you could, you put yourself in, in in the position of the daughter and the son, you know, how do you even rationalize with this? How do you even deal it? And then as reality is starting to dissolve and melt around them. Now, your man in the woods, played by Tommy Chong, he's the only one that understands, you know, and he says to him, can you not hear them? The aliens, they're under the water that they'd come into the water system down via the well. That's how they really got in after the meteorite. Uh, the film's great. And I'm not even a, a Nicolas Cage fan, really. And I have to say, it was an excellent movie. It, in the second time I watched it, I was like, wow, this film deserves 
uh, you know, a lot more credit than it's got. And as I said, there's, there's been no faithful telling of any Lovecraft story in, in, by, by, in a movie yet. Now, this is the closest one, I think, that, that comes to it. But yeah, I'd, gi I'd give it a 9 out of 10, easy. When, he, when you start to watch it, you have hope because it starts out, it's a nice film, it's a family, the, the wife, the mother, she was recovering from cancer, I think, in the story. So they'd move to the grandfather's country house to start a new life so she could heal and get better. There are voices in the well, almost like poltergeist activity, beautiful flowers growing in the garden from this colour, beautiful colours everywhere. It almost looks like a utopia in the garden, but underneath it, you've got this force that's neither yeah. evil nor nor good. It was just summoned there. It came to do its business. It was it was very graphic and very very gross, and then off it went. Yeah, uh, the alpacas in the book it was cows. They, they, were, they were it was a new breed of expensive cows, and the 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 tomatoes and the other vegetables grow really big and really fast early on but they're inedible uh, because the, the reality that they come from is not the reality here on earth it's, the, the color out of space is trying to adjust itself in the book it begins with the narrator approaching a place called the blasted area and it's now there is a real place like this in maine called the the the, the main desert and there's a part of maine that's all covered in sand and the blasted, uh, in the middle of the, the main woods, it might as well be in the Sahara. And, uh, and no one can explain it as well. And this place where the house, the Gardner household was, is called the blasted area or the blasted field or whatever. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's where the house, is, the final thing happened, the, the event. And uh, it's be, being buried by a reservoir. It's going to, when the dam is built, so it's all trace of it will be gone. But you know, your man still will never drink the water and this kind of thing, no matter even though it's safe, I'll never drink it. But um, that's how it begins in the film the, the devastated farmstead. And then he goes and finds this guy and he tells him what happened to the gardener family. And it happened like 50 years before the story is told. So it's set, the film is set in present day. But in the book, the Gardner event happened in the 1880s, and it's being told in the 1930s in the book. So, even you know, when you think about it, that was even more incredible, even for to write a story like that back then, you know, about those kinds of things. But uh, I did, you know, it's one of those double edged swords that when sometimes when there's a bit of creative license or artistic license thrown into the story, like Lavinia. Yeah, it can either flop or fail. But my God, with the Color Out of Space movie, it really was a fabulous addition to the storyline. Now, I don't know if it's true, but I've I've read people talking about people who've actually tried to summon the old ones using the Necronomicon that have actually died doing so. Now, I don't know if that's true. Have you heard about that? Do you know anything about that? No, I've heard about it, but I often wonder if it's just a northern a myth. Because mm -hmm. I, I've, I, I had, a, I've had quite good success with the, with the Simon Necronomicon years ago, and I know that uh, what's his name, Grant Morrison swears by it, and uh, he's had full manifestations of Lovecraftian entities in his living room, not not just shadows or voids, but actual things. So. Uh, Again, people say, I mean, I've got a book here that has a critic critique of it, and it's one of those kind of dickheads we were talking about earlier on. And he says, look, oh, it's all done for edgy teenagers. How could it possibly work? These people don't understand how, like, chaos works and how Discordia works. But, yeah, um, the, the, the book Simon's Necronomicon, huge seller, by the way, very popular. It's, it's, it's a credible grimoire. Absolutely, no doubt about it. And uh, there's, even, there's even workings in the... Uh, the Book of Dead Names by Colin Wilson that are written in, I think, with Phil Hine, who, uh, the Chaos Magician, that are definitely one of the, you know, the, the summoning of, the, you know, the symbol of Yorn, the summoning of the great, the great Cthulhu, and the use of megaliths in, in, in rituals. Yeah, I mean, the stuff's real. 
this is this is one more thing that Lovecraft was not a spoofer or not just someone who's interested in the cult. He'd have to have had a knowledge, a working knowledge to actually, you know. Now the thing with the people who died after summoning the entities, that was probably based on the the, the Necronomicon's lore itself that Al has read was ripped to beats, ripped the bits uh, in the middle of a marketplace, I think it was in Damascus, in front of people. A force came out of nowhere and torn to pieces. But I mean, yeah, I'm sure it have. Like people have brought, you know, have had heart attacks and stuff like that when they were doing magic or had, I went bonkers when they said they realized the stuff was actually real and it does happen. Uh, they, they just thought it was a bit of a laugh and then something actually happens. And they do, you know, they, they sometimes they might have heart attacks and things like that. Do you think that um, the, the the guy who brought the Lovecraftian creatures into his his living room, he saw them in his living room through doing the rituals in the Necronomicon. Do you think that was some kind of force that showed itself in that shape because that was the work yes. that he was doing, or was it egregorial, or are they, do these things exist, or what? No, it was a force that was manifested, just as you said, in a way that was encapsulated in the in the shape, design, whatever. He, he 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 he's he's also had tremendous uh, success with summoning the disembodied head of John Lennon while playing Beatles albums, and he said he's you know he he spoke about like how he'd have a giant head of John Lennon rotating in the living room like this. It just the John Lennon head shape that had wrapped itself around like a skin of this unknown force of the universe. And that's why you could have like the the lesser key of Solomon. Okay, the later editions have all these drawings, and some of them are like cute, you know, cute animal people and elves and stuff. Well, you will bring them forward like that in that shape, but it's only because that's what you're expecting to bring forward. Otherwise, it's probably similar to what I've got a few times over the years, and it's just like this thing that's devoid. It's just a black, a blackness. And it has no, it had no form. It was just black, and it made electronic noises and stuff like that. But other people do have like you know whatever they want to come through. Like there's been sightings of Supermans and Batmans. There was a famous story of the guy who wrote the Shadow Stories in his Greenwich Village apartment in New York that he was under tremendous pressure to write these stories as a serial for a magazine, and he put so much effort and work into it that when he left the apartment, up until this day people see the shadow on the stairs, the, the actual comic book character, the story character, because it, it was brought, that whatever force was in that building, it encapsulated itself around the shadow. Well, that's fascinating to think mm. that, it would, that this force, whatever it is, will come through as whatever you are expecting or whatever frame of mind you're in or whatever working you're doing in what book. Yeah, hence UFOs. I mean, it, the first sightings of UFOs were like ships or balloons floating above the countryside. Then they became kind of like steampunk airships. Then they became kind of rudimentary um, aircraft, helicopters, and then UFOs. And now we have the UAP where they just lights to turn at high speed and angles. The force will adapt to what you expect. If you're expecting a gray alien, you'll get a gray alien. If you're expecting Narya Lapatep, you'll get Narya Lapatep. In fact, Narya Lapatep seems to be what the shadow persons all are. You know, so then, you know, did Lovecraft encounter the shadow person? And that is that Narya Lapatep, you know, the taunter of humans. You know, it's very interesting stuff. It's a whole, you know, you could spend years talking about it. That just put me in mind then. That concept was actually covered in a comedic way in uh, Ghostbusters when they were on top of the Empire State Building and they told the character of Dan Aykroyd not to think of anything because whatever you think of, it's going to appear in that way. And then he he, he thought of Mr. Softy, I think it was, the big the big marshmallow man. And that thing, it manifested as that thing. So Yeah, it's a very funny scene, but it's also true, like, the state, he says, what, what did you see? What did you see? And he goes, a state puff marshmallow man. And the whole <laughs> cinema just screamed out laughing when the giant marshmallow man came, came down Fifth Avenue. <laughs> he said, uh, he tried to think of the most... Clear your mind, you know, clear your mind, clear your mind. And he says, I, I can't help it. It just popped, what popped into your head? 
and you're thinking like King Kong or something to stay put, man. So. <laughs> I think it was Bill Murray, wasn't it? The one that's I can't remember. Yeah, it was great though. Yeah, it was a good scene, but yeah, it, it's got some credence to it. Whatever you're expecting, that's why you have to be careful with this stuff. I would imagine. Yeah, well, that's you see, that's another thing about the color of space. Lavinia showed why Gardner and Crowley created Wicca. So we wouldn't have we wouldn't have met accidents like that. Good point. And and they gave them stuff that doesn't work. Oh, oh stuff that does work, but it it destroys you. Yeah, or or else they'll do terrible harm to innocent people. You know, some guy that they fancy and won't go out with them, they 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 hex them and they kill his kids and everything. You know, that was why mm -hmm. Gar that's why Gardner and Crowley created the Wiccan Road. Yeah. And the fact that this the Lavinia character summoned this by doing the ritual and not closing it down or doing something wrong gives that scene where the mother and the son were joined together when the colour zapped them both and fused them together. That gate that made that even more horrific because as she stood there and watched on, deep down she knew that she'd caused that and yeah, by play magic, by playing cosplay, she was dressed up like a cosplay Wiccan at the lake. But also, it tells you about where you do it as well, because it didn't mention in the film, but in the book, there was a megalith in the lake on an island, and that was used by ancient people to call forth these cosmic beings, just like Sentinel Hill was in the Dunwich Horror. And uh, and that's you know another aspect of Lovecraft. He definitely had knowledge of America, B.C., that there, you know, he spoke about like megaliths that, you know, and he even said in, in the Dunwich Horror, he even says, you know, the ridiculous concept that these are actually pre-Indian. And, you know, he was telling us this, or, what we're discovering, what Americans are discovering all around New England now. They're discovering that those megaliths were built in New England. You know, it's like the, the somehow the, the ancient people of Europe were also in, in New England, you know, and he knew this and that must have been true Whipple, you know. The grand, grandfather Whipple. I mean, it, it is amazing. You go up to Booksport in Maine, and the red paint people were found there. Uh, their civilization was, these are the same people who built Stonehenge. What were they doing in Maine? You know, so he, the, 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 the Freemasons in New England knew a lot of this stuff. And this is why you have stories like the Dunwich Horror, you have the Lurking Fear. Uh, the shadow over it, not so much that one, but like uh, the color of space, uh, the the dreams in the witch house, they all take place in small villages in the mountainous and forested regions of New England. And they all are places that no one really wanted to live. And the ones who remained there, like uh, Salem's and Salem's Lot and Stephen King's story, the ones who remain there are like the ones in the book, Return to Salem's Lot. There's something in them that keeps them there among the darkness. And that, uh, that was also hinted in the color of space that the father, the father, there was something in him that drew him into that neighborhood, into that town. Because they, they, they do the correct soliloquy, the prologue at the beginning of the movie where they talk about, you know, just in the hills above Arkham are trees that are so old they've never seen an axe. They grow differently. This kind of thing. So it was very, he was very much aware of the environomicon, as I started calling it in recent years, uh, that there was certain locations uh, within New England, in those woods, in those hills, that are not of this reality. And that's what the, the color of space, re because the father had moved in there to open this alpaca farm. And the daughter, a lonely teenage girl bored, got into Wicca and magic. And she she opened up, you know, she opened up a door that she was unable to close. But when she's absorbed into the force at the end to become one with Azatoth or whatever, whatever it is, the, the old ones, she has an almost euphoric look on her face like uh, she's been brought to heaven. So there's a there's there's an unspoken darkness in some of those characters in that film, the father and the daughter. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I noticed that with the father when 
they they put the mother and the son in that room and wouldn't let them out, obviously, because they weren't the mother and the son anymore. They, it was something else. And he locked the daughter in there with her. Yeah. The book has that a- aspect of the great human tragedy of the story as well, that you do feel terribly sad for this family. And as the story is being re- recounted to the narrator, you do feel this overwhelming sadness. His family just wanted to get on with their lives. And this, the color of space came for them. But I do like the way in the film that they said it wasn't, you know, a, a random bullet, you know, that she had actually opened the portal. Well, they don't tell you at the beginning. You, you kind of, you'd have to know about magic later on to understand that's exactly what happened. Yeah, she called and, they, and it answered. We're a cosplay magic. She didn't fully understand what she was doing. She was the typical teenage girl playing Wicca or playing, you know, we are the witch, doing that whole thing, you know. So the colour of space is actually a good warning for teenagers. Yeah, don't play around with magic. Unless you know, really know what you're doing and you know the environment inside out. And could you know, could you know that at the age that that character was? I don't think so. Yeah, no, no, and she wasn't from around there, and she was bored, and she didn't know there was a megalith on the on the on, on the island in the lake where she was doing the ritual. So that was the colour out of space. It's a heavy cosmic horror film that starts off nice and gentle and ends up at virtual insanity. Have you seen it already, or are you planning to give it a watch? Please let us know your thoughts on the film in the comments if you do. And actually. Speak, speaking of Lovecraft films, do you have any other suggestions that people can go and watch of adaptations of H.P. Lovecraft stories in film form? There's not many adaptations. There is a film, a version of the Dunwich Hearts, rubbish. But there's some fantastic films that are homages indirectly or inspired by the Lovecraftian cosmic horror mythos. Well, The, the Thing with Kurt Russell, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's one of the better ones. Uh, the Lighthouse, the Roger Ebers one, and I would actually also mention The Witch as an honourable mention, even though it's set in Puritan times. I think that's very much has a lot of that kind of element to it. Uh, I mentioned The Mist, Island of Terrors with Peter Cushing. It's a kind of it's set on an, it's a it's kind of like an Irish Lovecraftian thing, one that's set on an island, uh, Quatermass from you know Quatermass in the Pit, the the Hammer movie version which we reviewed here, absolutely. And uh, there's, there was uh, From Beyond, which I didn't really like. And I didn't really like the, the Reanimator either. They, they, I just thought they were a bit too 80s sensationalist like Goff. Uh, the, uh, the Day of the Triffids was it, would be another one. And uh, yeah, I think the two, the two best ones, I think, would be The Mist and... Uh, and uh, the thing, they'd be the two, like, the two best ones. You know, when you think about it, people are introduced to Lovecraft without even knowing it sometimes. Because just talk, when you was reeling those films off then, Pirates of the Caribbean came into my head as an example. I mean, look at Davy Jones in that movie. He's the image of um, Cthulhu. And he looks like yep. he's straight out of the Cthulhu mythos. Could be a, a second cousin or something. So you, you actually exposed to him his um, influence in other people's work and art and films without even realising sometimes. Yeah, there was The Deep, which is an 80s science fiction film, and there's a terrible, stupid ending that ruins it. And there was another one called The Visitors, I think, where they had like these seven-legged cephalopods who were kind of octopusy, and they had these neat scenes of them writing in uh, alien language and in, in ink. But that had a, that had a shitty... Uh, Sorry, no offense, but American ending, you know, like the, you know, apple pie and mum kind of ending, which ruins a lot of Hollywood films for me like that. Uh, I'm a bit of a miserable bastard. I like like a, a bit of a nasty ending. But yeah, I mean, there's, lot, there's lots of films that, you know, I, I even, you know, there's even films that are not like in that genre, but they feel it to me. Like The Shining that has that. And that's not at all, really, but it feels that way to me, as does Salem's Lot, the, the, the one with David's soul, even though it's a vampire story. They, it has that vibe as well. So, you know, and, and there's a couple of Hammer films, too. I'm just trying to think of ones that would be Dracula AD, you know, uh, 
Jack Dracula AD 72 would be no, no, would it, not that one. Uh, the Satanic Rites of Dracula and Dracula AD 72 would have that vibe to both of them. And so, um, yeah, like you said, lots of people have been expo exposed to the genre and not just assume it was it came from nowhere. But it didn't really. It, it, it has it, it has this. Uh, I would even give an honorable mention to the 1954 version of Moby Dick with Gregory Peck. That has that vibe too as well. It doesn't have to be directly related to it, but it has that energy, that gravitas that you find in the stories. But yeah, there's there's not a, apparently there's I assume there's apparently supposed to be a rumor of the at the mountains of madness in production. But I don't know how true that is. I don't know how true it is. I've actually got one that you didn't mention set up to watch in a couple of um probably tomorrow, Event Horizon with Sam Neill. I haven't seen it. Have you not seen that? They um come across um well they come up to the event horizon of a black hole and that's filled with uh, Lovecraftian creatures that kind of just reside in this black hole. Oh, okay. I didn't know about that. Uh, there you go, another one, Alien. Yeah. Alien would yeah. be another one. And G Giger actually did his own version of the Necronomicon. Yes, he did. Kind of, kind of, kind of. He had a go at it, yeah. Yes, there's plenty of films then as well. The one with uh, Donald Pleasance, I think we even reviewed it, uh, in the, 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 the Force Inside the Church in, uh, what was it called? The one that had Alice Cooper in it and... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was an 80s one, wasn't it? Where he had the green liquid. Prince of Darkness, Prince of Darkness. That would def that's definitely a Lovecraftian film. Look back on the old episodes and just put a note in the description which episode yeah. we reviewed that movie in. And, and Jacob's Ladder is another one too. See, we've got like three years worth of Elkus Focus Future Reviews here to film reviews to do here. Jacob's Ladder. Yeah, he's inspired and influenced lots and lots of movies. And how many people, it's writers can say that? And I'd still, but I'd still love to see one done historically correct in the nineteen twenties. I'd love to see a version of something just to call it Cthulhu, or, or you know, the strange case of Charles Dexter, Dexter Ward. But some, some of the more the smaller ones, like the Dream and the Witch House, I'd love to see that done in the nineteen twenties aesthetic with the old Model T Fords and the the kind of clothes and stuff like that. You mentioned the Dunwich Horror. I have that to watch. It's a 1970s version with Faye Dunaway. Is that the one that you mean is crap? Is that no good? Very disappointing. It didn't do nothing for me. But maybe I could. I haven't seen it in years. I could go back and look at it again. It did nothing for me. Uh, yeah, I read that story the other night, actually, because I can't help. But now, since we've been planning for this episode, I've been reading a story at night time and um, not something I would have normally done but like I say they're quite addictive and you want to read another one just to see how how far into the depths of despair these stories really go The Haunter in the Dark is another one I'd love to see made into a film I think that could make a again using the proper 1920s aesthetic the, the, the church on top of Federal Hill I was you know that would just be such a superb a visual treat to do that, you know. Mercury goes retrograde on April 1st. Generally, as always, don't panic or think there has to be some catastrophe looming somewhere. It might not be a big deal for you at all. I'm going to make an extra post for this, so stay tuned. If you follow my channel, you'll find it in the community tab or on Facebook and the other social media channels. 
It's best to not enter into binding commitments during this time, though, as they tend to not be of a very lasting nature, and simply keep your cool and avoid spending too much money. Mercury goes direct again on April 25th and leaves the dreaded shadow zone on May 13th. On April 5th, Venus enters Aries. Venus is representative of love and money, and she is much more courageous, more combative and gutsy in Aries. And she loves the romantic conquest and is definitely actively pursuing what she wants. She's quite demanding also, but she has high romantic ideals. Money matters can also be affected by this placement, meaning we might be more willing to take risks. But be careful because Mercury is in retrograde. So make sure you're not jumping headfirst into situations that may be too volatile or may not be what they seem. On April 8th, we have one of the most important astrological events, which is a solar eclipse. It will take place at 19 degrees Aries, and it is a hugely important event that will have effects for at least the next six months, if not longer. It is referred to as the Great North American Eclipse because it can be observed from parts of North America. I'm going to make a separate post dedicated to this, of course, but very briefly on a personal level, it can signify independence or the fight for independence, self-reliance, going for what you want. But globally, the picture is quite different and it might look like war, social unrest or aggression, pent up anger coming to the surface, control, seizing power, especially in light of the upcoming elections, of course, in the USA. The eclipse will take place in the USA's fourth house, which represents the homeland directly. It also conjuncts the natal Chiron, bringing an extra layer of potential violence, as Chiron denotes an area of wounding or unhealed issues or vulnerabilities. Along with the dominance of transiting Aries planets, this is very much a portent for violent escalation of some sort. The Sun enters Taurus. Taurus is a fixed Earth sign ruled by Venus. The time quality of the season is usually pretty chill, focused on material and physical well-being, enjoying the good things in life, socializing with family and friends, and not necessarily making huge aggressive moves. With a supportive sextile between the Sun and Saturn, Mars and Neptune and Pisces, we could be more focused on our inner life, spiritual endeavors that also have a practical value for us, or the relationship between our intuition and reason. Jupiter is also in Taurus, giving us extra motivation to seek out enjoyment and abundance in our material circumstances, including self-improvement and the pleasures of sensuality in general, but Uranus can always add an element of surprise. On a personal level, it could be a new idea or perspective that yanks us out of our comfort zone and inspires us to see things from a different side, or a concrete development with broader global implications, but more on that later. On April 21st, Jupiter conjuncts Uranus, also a very, very important event. This could be pretty huge in terms of global financial or tech matters, for example, or maybe even natural disasters. Uranus brings an element of unpredictability, disorder, chaos, unrest, socially or otherwise, turning things upside down, and Jupiter will exaggerate whatever he comes into contact with. Therefore, it is quite likely that some destabilizing event could take place in the aforementioned areas roundabout between mid-April and early May. Another possibility is something water-related or something like a mysterious disappearance of people with an element of deception. Since Jupiter rules Pisces and makes a supportive sextile to Saturn and Neptune in Pisces, and also Mars until the end of the month. On April 23rd, we have a full moon in Scorpio, which gets an extra post, of course. On April 29th, Venus enters Taurus. This is Venus home turf because Venus rules Taurus. And in this sign, the focus is on unpretentious enjoyment of the good and beautiful things in life, wholesome things such as being with good friends, enjoying some downtime, good food, pleasure, but also the small luxuries that can bring us joy, stuff like beautiful perfumes and whatnot, or 
easygoing relationships that bring us comfort or making our home into a cozy cocoon where we feel sheltered from the chaotic BS around us. We are more focused on financial stability where realism and pleasure can find a healthy balance, ideally. However, with good old chaos bringer Uranus in this sign, there might not be so much stability, especially not globally, of course. But that doesn't mean that we can, for example, educate ourselves about better money management or opportunities for growth and do what we can to at least protect ourselves from our own impulsivity. This alone can go a long way to providing us with a greater sense of safety. With the sun also in Taurus, we have a very strong need for safety. And with the great benefic Jupiter present, Mercury almost out of its retrograde PMS, I'd say this is a pretty good placement for making solid and favorable long-term decisions or working on your attitude on a personal level. Having said that, watch out for possible global stress factors, as mentioned earlier, bad news or general instability, whether real or touted as imminent, and use discernment, don't trust hyped up scenarios. There might be a power move from the big boys in big tech or big money, or maybe some event pertaining to AI, for example. On April 30th, Mars enters Aries, the sign which he rules and makes the danger of escalation, impatience, risk-taking for better or worse, or outright aggression even more immediate than it already is. We might see escalations worldwide, potentially events or attacks involving fire or the use of weapons such as guns or knives, or a greater propensity for accidents and basically flaring up and just losing our SHIT. On the other hand, Mars in Aries can make people a lot bolder and straightforward in a good way, empowering them and fueling their confidence, which can do wonders if they are usually struggling with getting over an inner or outer obstacle, for example, such as shyness or fear and stuff like that. And now will not be the time for lame compromises. We will all feel more combative and ready to be active, to confront things and people head on, which again could be a really good thing for some people, to solve problems, sometimes in a pretty harsh way, and maybe in some cases that is exactly what is needed. Health-wise, we could find that our metabolism is much faster than during Pisces season, which was extremely slow, and we burn away extra fat or retained water just dissipates more easily. But be careful with anything involving the head, as the malefic Mars in Aries brings a sensitivity to head injuries, fast fevers, and hot-headedness in the literal and proverbial sense. If you wish to follow me on social media, just check out my website. All the links are there. And this is also the place where you can book a reading with me if you're interested in your birth chart, in learning about your birth placement, or in a general outlook for the coming year or months or even specific dates where you plan something, for instance. And I will see you next month. Bye bye. And after all that incomprehensible, ghastly, unspeakable gore and cosmic horror of the last hour and a half, well, here's a good way to clean it off, Sarah and the, the psychic hygiene. I was going to do this week's psychic hygiene in a Lovecraftian style, but honestly, it would have took me weeks to do it. But this this one is quite an important one, and I didn't want to make light of it. Two things have inspired this month's psychic hygiene. <clears throat> Firstly, I was inspired by the ancestral work I'd been doing, and I've always believed in the power of my ancestors and their ability to guide me in various aspects of life. 
and they have been they've been a source of strength and have helped me overcome many many challenges and whenever I've been carried away by an idea without thinking it through it's always been their gentle pull on my collar that reminds me the importance of pausing and looking before I leap off the edge of the cliff and their guidance has been invaluable and I'm always grateful for the presence in my life and secondly Secondly, I've just finished watching a series, an American drama series called Yellowstone and all of its spin-offs. And the show is about the Dutton family who founded a ranch in Montana and the subsequent generations who are fighting to keep the land from big corporations and the government. And the series sort of showcases the stunning Montana scenery and it emphasises how close we actually are to our ancestors and how we become part of the land. And it's a beautiful series and I highly recommend it. Now, throughout history, our ancestors have been an important part of our existence, <clears throat> our values and our beliefs. And they are the people we have descended from. And the lineage starts with our parents and grandparents and it can go back thousands of years. And as descendants... We carry our ancestors' bloodline and we are connected to them both genetically and spiritually. Now that bond allows us to seek their guidance and support in matters concerning family, land and ourselves and their experiences and wisdom and knowledge are part of our heritage and have been passed down through generations, through the stories and traditions and it can provide us with a sense of belonging and by acknowledging and honouring our ancestors, we can tap into the spiritual energy and receive their blessings and assistance. And as an individual, you carry within you the essence of your ancestors. And this connection isn't only limited to the physical resemblance to your immediate family members. It goes way back to your ancient lineage from the earliest of times. Now, your ancestors have walked the same land that you walk today and their spirits linger on. And by calling on the presence through meditation, contemplation, or even setting a place for them at the dinner table, or making symbolic offerings with food, you can access their deep wisdom and strength that they possess. Now, across various indigenous cultures, there's a belief that ancestral spirits are found in the natural world. And these spirits are said to reside in the trees, the water, the air, the animals, the stones and even the birds and the indigenous people believe that the blood of their ancestors runs deep within the earth beneath the feet making the very ground that they walk on a sacred and spiritual space. This deep connection between the land and the spirits serves to remind us of the importance of respecting and preserving the land from globalist ideals now, we've passed the spring equinox by the time this episode goes out and the clocks have gone forward <clears throat> and better weather and lighter nights are here. So next time you go outside for a walk, just take a moment to let your senses soak up the environment around you and be mindful of the subtle energies around you and pay attention to nature's sights, sounds and smells. Open your heart to the spirits related to you through your own ancestry. And you can also take a moment to recognise the spirits connected to you through the land upon which you live by appreciating the natural beauty around you and showing gratitude for all that the land offers. Maybe even take your shoes off and walk barefoot on the land and see if you can sense, feel or see in your mind's eye who walked here in times past. Just consider calling upon your ancestors and ask for their guidance and support on your life's journey because you never know what insights they might bestow upon you that could improve your life. That is my psychic hygiene suggestion for this month. Yeah, thanks for that. I've been thinking about a lot of stuff myself lately. It's like, where were the the tip of a pyramid that goes back a very long and a very wide distance into in surprising places, but it doesn't matter, just what we are. The 
from the ceremony of the nine angles it's a ritual developed by michael a aquino a former member of the church of satan and later the founder of the temple of set a religious organization that emerged from within the church of satan the ritual is considered one of the central practices within the temple of set which is a religion and a philosophy focused on individualism self-deification and the pursuit of personal excellence the specific details of the ceremonies are not widely disclosed outside of the temple of set itself as the organization maintains strict secrecy about its rituals and practices however it is generally understood the ritual involves the invocation and expiration of various symbolic and metaphysical concepts relating to the angles which are spheres corresponding to different aspects of the human consciousness the universe and various metaphysical principles this may represent different perspectives or pathways to understanding reality or achieving personal growth and transformation as with many esoteric and occult practices the ceremony is likely to facilitate personal development self-awareness and spiritual exploration for practitioners within the context of the temple of sets broader philosophical framework also within the satanic rituals aquino presents a chapter on lovecraftian metaphysics which includes the ceremony of the nine angles and also the call of cthulhu as both independent lovecraftian cthulhu rituals no other subject in the satanic rituals has had as much dedication to it as the Cthulian mythos. Aquino considered Lovecraft to be a philosopher in an almost tragic Faustian sense, who reluctantly in his own youth brought him in direct contact with the great old ones, possibly as a result of experimentation and magic using his grandfather's occultic library. This resulted in such trauma to the young Lovecraft that he was only to spend the rest of his life denying the supernatural as a kind of aversion therapy. Aquino considers the Lovecraft mythos to represent no malicious danger to humanity that exists to instruct humans on our personal growth and psychological development by virtue of coming into contact with them. The likes of Cthulhu and other members of the Pantheon do not require specific veneration in order to appease them and should only be celebrated during specific festivals. However, Aquino also denotes an element of servility similar to Islam or Orthodox Christianity when venerating entities such as Cthulhu. Aquino, like others, believed that Lovecraft himself believed the great old ones were never conclusive stereotypes of either good or evil they vacillate constantly between beneficiaries and cruelty it is the self-destructive nature and ignorance of the protagonists within the cthulhu mythos who generate their own destruction rather than attaining wisdom and enlightenment the ceremony is to be undertaken within a closed chamber with no curved surfaces illuminated by a single flame before an altar behind which there is a sign of a trapezoid all partaking in the ritual must wear masks to disguise their identities to protect them for the rest of their lives from malicious entities who may be present or who have encroached upon the ritual the ceremony is performed using the Ugothic language developed by Aquino to raise the charge of the celebrant's nervous system and heightened senses. Azathoth is called upon as the great center of the cosmos, Yog Sagoth, master of dimensions, Narya Lapatop, black prince from the barrier, and Shub Nigaruth, father of the world of horrors. Following the petition of the nine angels, each representing a cosmic sphere presided over and by an old one the celebrant intones that the hounds are loosened upon the barrier and shall not pass and the hounds will come to bow before us and apes shall speak with the tongues of the hornless ones the way is yog sagot the key is narya lapatep hail yog sagot hail narya lapatep 
concerning the call of Cthulhu, the ritual must be performed near a major body of water. On an overcast night when the water is filled with movement, the celebrants also evoke other water gods and titans, such as the Kraken, Poseidon, Typhon, Dagon, Neptune, Leviathan, Midgard, and Cthulhu himself, chanting, I danced and I killed, and I laughed at the apes, and in the Rael I die to sleep, the master of the plains and the angles. The ritual ends with the banishing of Yahweh as the god of death who will be overthrown upon the return of the old ones. Beneath the baleful gibbous moon, shining upon the dark depths of the fathomless sea, where the Lord Cthulhu lies dreaming, from Riley to the shadowed shores of Innsmouth, where madness reigns supreme and sanity is but a fleeting illusion. Here's Thomas with the psychic weather. Outdoor today for this week's Psychic Weather Report here on Hocus Focus. We're at beautiful Loch Talt in the Ox Mountains in County Sligo on the County Sligo Mayo border, quite a wilderness area. Appropriate enough, this lake once had a legend of a, of a lake monster, which was banished about a thousand years ago. It's also quite a sinister place. There's lots of suicides and other things in there, so that's not a very pleasant place. About one time 15 years ago, I went for a swim in it, and I got out as soon as I was in there. So back to the psychic weather. What's the story with the psychic weather this week? Renfielding galore. There's a lot of Renfielding going on, even by people not given to Renfield. I've even Renfielded myself at one point. And I think a lot of it has to do with the sense of disturbance in the world. We've had some pretty strange events lately, as nasty ones as too, like the bridge that fell in Baltimore, and that set a lot of people off. I'd be more inclined to see that in terms of auguries than actual anything conspiratorial. Not that I could see anyway. It's, it's setting people off. It's a strangeness, it's a insecurity in the world right now. There's horrible things happening, like a terrorist attack in Russia. Everyone's feeling unstable, a lot of anxiety. What's the best thing to do? Nature, get out there, get away from the computer, do something creative, and uh, get, your, get your head together. You know, get your head together. And uh, the best way to do that is switch off from, like if you're into conspiratorial stuff, it's probably not a good thing to do that right now. Wait till the things have melted down and got a bit quiet. So that's the psychic weather this week. This is Loch Talt, and there's, there's a, there used to be a monster in there. And apparently that lake is so deep that they measured it with sonar in the 70s and couldn't find the bottom. So uh, until next time, back in the studio. As I exit the psychic weather report and I'm back here in the studio, I am reminded of a lot of the negative criticism that's put towards Lovecraft. Uh, some of his biographers have called him uh, an individual who absolutely hated life. I think that was a bit unfair and a bit drastic. I think he was a very complex man. And we really don't know a lot about his inner world because he's, we're always, a, what we know about him is addressed to the two other people in almost a formal sense. He wrote something like 50,000 letters in his lifetime, many of which still exist. How much he talked about everything under the sun to friends and acquaintances and colleagues. He was married to a woman, Sonia Green, who was herself said that they had a perfectly normal, happy, marriage there was nothing weird about it and it just ended like a lot of marriages too probably because you could never be happy in new york and she was more career focused so they had an amiable splitting but she said in every way she said he was a, a, a you know he was a good husband so you know we don't like again a lot about his inner world is hidden because mm -hmm. it's always been reduced to academic things even towards when he was dying in, of cancer at the hospital, his, his notes were not really 
this kind of pathos, you know, when facing the end, he took down notes on how on how the cancer progressed, how the medications worked, after having discussions with his doctor on the actual specifics of procedures. It was just very strange, but very interesting too. It could have been an aversion therapy kind of tactic, but he he gets criticism because they say he's obsessed with genetic genetic issues. He was a man of his time. He came from a period where eugenics and things like that were real sciences. And he he would warn about inbreeding, you know, in the the shadow out of Innsmouth, the station porter at Newburyport, I think it is, um, says to him, you know, the people that live down there, what, what they call down south, white trash. And he talks about genetic problems in all around the place, you know, in, in the hills outside Dunwich, and outside Battleborough, Vermont. And he's describing the banjo players from Deliverance. And the psychic breakdown of these communities is bringing in uh, the these these forces from outside. But he may also have been talking about his own family. He came from a very strict close-knit New England Presbyterian, Anglo-Saxon, Puritan stock, Yankee. And maybe he knew deep down inside that the psychiatric problems that were inherent in his father and his mother may have been, or at least he's wounded if it had been, a result of genetic decay of, rather than white trash inbreeding, uh, these Yankee blue bloods inbreeding instead. So I often wonder if that was not only an aversion therapy, but also a kind of um, self-insight into what the fears that drove him. He had no desire to have children or anything like that, it seems. And um, and maybe he believed at some level this is what they mean by a family curse. You know, you deteriorate and you, 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 you fall apart. And... It, it, when you think about it in that way, it, it, it's not like he's saying, you know, towards the end of his rape, end of his life, he even admitted to people that he was very prejudiced when he was younger, and he's embarrassed by it now. He said that it was that was born out of being socially isolated and not really having any friends in school, so he had a, a natural suspicion of strangers, and if they had a different skin color or a different, uh, they're foreigners and stuff like that, he could be quite, you know, quite hostile. And he said at the end of his life, he realized that he was this awful old Tory, and he needed to, that his, you know, his biggest regret was not being more open-minded when he was younger. So he had, he had changed, you know, he had, he'd grown as a person through his correspondences and his friendships and things like that that he had realized the world was a more complex place. The Irish Times a few years ago did a feature on him, and it was a typical piece of, typical of that rag. They were basically woke and saying that Irish people shouldn't shouldn't, uh, read Lovecraft's works for the way he betrayed the Irish. And I was thinking about it, and he really doesn't betray him in a bad way. He, you know, they were just looking for an excuse for to, to put, bring him into council culture. And the character of Thomas Malone in the horror Red Cup, but he's incredibly sympathetic towards this guy and talks about him in very glowing terms, like he's a, a, an educate, a Dublin educated university man, you know, who grew up in, the, by the, in a Georgian mansion by the Phoenix Park, but had a, the Celts far vision of the weird and hidden things. It was almost like it was an admirable thing. I wish I had that. I wish I had that sort of like Celtic sense of things. And then the Moonbog, they didn't really portray the Irish as being kind of any worse than anyone else. The, you know, the, 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 the residents of Kildare, they were, you know, old fashioned people that told him not to drain the bog because what if he drains the bog to, to make development land, it will, it will unleash the horrors from the past. And he does drain it. And that was proven that they were right. They, they turned out to be correct. Don't drain the bog. And he drained the bog. 
And uh, that would make a great movie too, that one also. And he, you know, you, you, they, they, we know the name of the cat in The Rats in the Wall, uh, the, 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 the N-word. And again, that, that wasn't, that was just of its time. You know, it wasn't necessarily a hateful thing. And the, the cat is, is portrayed very admirably as a, as a loyal pet and this kind of thing. And uh, we hear about the nautical looking Negro who tripped up his, his uncle at the call of Cthulhu on the, on the dock, at, I think it was a Fall River. And this kind, of, and then people immediately jump on that. Oh, all the bodies are dark skinned, but they're not. Edward, Edward West wasn't, and lots of the others aren't. And, uh, or, or they you know, so I think it's an easy thing to throw at him. He lived in a time where people were not politically correct were not awake and where there was tremendous prejudice. But the people who probably lived through that would just probably say, actually, that's how it was back then. You know, that's how it was. They wouldn't have had the same attitude of people that they're like, I was oppressed. I, you know, my auntie, this, you know, this kind of thing. It, it wasn't like that at all. And so he gets an unfair tag in that way. Absolutely he does. And his obsession with genetics is not an obsession he's warning about the dangers of inbreeding. You know, deliverance. But he's also talking about aristocratic inbreeding. We know what happens at that bunch as well, what happens to them. Doesn't the queen have a sister somewhere? Is it live, in, live her whole life in a mental hospital because she has genetic de de you know, deterioration, the queen of England, because, uh, because of inbreeding and all this kind of other things? So he wasn't off the wall that way. What I find most fascinating is the and most interesting is the, the the use of letters in communication inside stories like the call of cthulhu he's reading his uncle's diary you know that we're hearing transcripts we're hearing dispatches i think the use of them is unprecedented no other author comes close the way he does it like in the uh, the whisperer in darkness well, the whisper in the darkness is even better. The whisper in the darkness, you have the communique between the guy in the university and the other one who's, who's been in Battleborough, just north of Battleborough in Vermont. And he's talking about that, that these strange, there was a flood and these strange beings washed up and they look like giant insects. And then he relays this whole thing to him. Well, this is kind of, it's a great kind of x files -y type story. Uh, where it's going back, where he has to sneak the dispatches to the train station without the porter seeing them, because there's definitely some kind of lockdown going on, a kind of a, a gag order. And at the same time, too, he, he unleashed this incredible, says, you'll think me mad uh, at first, but then you'll realize I'm telling the truth. And he talks about these being called the Migo, who are giant insects who fly from an outer, from outer space to mine a, a mineral that only is in the mountains of Vermont and they don't generally bother human beings unless the human beings encroach upon their territory and then sometimes they capture them and take them back to their planet which is kind of scary but they don't travel in spaceships they fly they fly with wings and that reminded me of that you know that recent UAP video of that thing that was called the flying octopus or something like that it reminded me of that but the use of the use of letters, communique, and dispatches in his writing is I, I've never seen anything better than it ever, and even ones that are known for it, like Victor Hugo, I still don't think are as good as him. The, the, the way he can have they're so plausible these dialogues between two people, particularly in the Whisper in the Darkness, they're so plausible, and or the reading of diaries, the, or the finding of sigils, you know, like the, the horror from the middle span, you know, the, the dismantling of the house and being told, if you find anything, you kill it, no matter what it looks like. The grandfather's letter. You have, uh, you, you, you have these descriptions that are always like a third party, like the, 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 the Color of Space book where he's been relaying the story of what, what is the, the blasted area, what, what happened there. And there's a great, uh, what's the word? 
you, you read his books, but they're like a comic book. Even it's it's that it's that visualness, visual nature of the uh, the, the text that the pictures come flying into your head. I'm not surprised there's so much Lovecraftian artwork, you know, because you he you, you can smell the gasoline on the streets. You can smell the coffee in the in in the diners. You can hear the footsteps in the rain. You can, when he describes it, he's airing out the musty old house and, you know, he's trying to make a bed and sleep with the, uh, the everything is, it smells of damp and mold. You can really feel it. it. He, I have a theory that one of the reasons that there hasn't been a direct movie made of his stuff is because it's probably be too easy because his descriptions throw you back into those places. And I've been to many of those places. I've been to, the, the mountains of New England, the forest, the woods. I've been to those seaside towns. I mean, you, this location report, uh, uh, the, the the Peabody heritage that you watched, that was that was that was not based on a place called Peabody, Massachusetts, which is like today looks like exactly what you'd imagine Innsmouth was preserved or Newburyport looks like. A lot of those places do still look like that up around the coast of Maine heading up that way and around the coast of Mass. Still, still to this day, they look like that. And the woods in around New England and those places do have, do you know, they're still dense, heavily forested. Some of them are old growth forest, just like that. Never seen an axe, like he said. And the way he talks about, you know, it just passed the Massachusetts Turnpike, the road to Attleboro. The, the, the way he describes the roads, you, you see them in your head. You know, I'm not surprised he's a, he, the Lovecraftian mythos is huge within RPG games, role-playing games like the Call of Cthulhu, because the the visual world is painted so beautifully at that level that it it, it comes into you. And I, I think some of the some of the audio recordings, there's two fantastic ones by David McCallum, and they're both free on YouTube, where the actor David McCallum had died recently from the Man from Uncle. He does The Hunter in the Dark and The Rats in the Wall and The Dunwich Horror, and they're fantastic. Now, he does it because he, does, he, he doesn't have an overly British accent, and that's another one of my pet peeves. I only like to hear an American man's accent, but particularly like a New England accent kind of thing. They're not thought like, you know, a Boston, and, but like um, the, the audio books, there's one written, but there's one narrated by Benedict Cumberbatch, and it's just crap. I don't like when English, or, you know, unless it's an English character, like the Delapore guy, or that kind of thing. But Dave McCallum does it well because he does the accents. He goes into the accents of the characters because he was an actor. But again, you just like the visual, just floats. It's, it was almost like he was conjuring. And he was conjuring, like with the Necronomicon, he, he created an alternative magical text that had passed through the hands of John D and Edward Kelly to where it ended up in Miskatonic University, which doesn't exist, but he he never went to university because of poor health. So he created a university of, in his mind that was his dream university, Miskatonic. He, he idealized Arkham out of a supplementary or complementary version of Providence. And it goes on and on and on. The, the, Mis- the upper reaches of the Miskatonic River, you go there, you know. And there's always a hint of something real. Yes, the the Necronomicon does lend itself to text, Arabic uh, grimoires and stuff like that, and, and even like things like the Lesser Key of Solomon. Yes, there those kinds of villages do exist up in, up in New England. Yes, those woodlands. Yes, there are Arkham-type towns. Yes, there are Mysticonic-type universities. Yes, there are stone circles in, and megaliths in New England. But he... He takes what's real and makes it extra real. He creates another world on top of it. That's amazing, really amazing. Talking about the visuals, um, one story that really put the visuals into my mind and made me feel like I was there with the narrator was The Hidden City. It, It put me in mind of the movie The Borderlands because he was crawling through the caves and as he was getting further and further into the cave... It was getting smaller and smaller, and then he ended up on his knees, and then he was on all fours, and he was crawling, and I'm thinking, what's this guy crawling into? And eventually he comes to an abyss. But 
his use of adjectives in his stories is not just an abyss and it's not a dark abyss, it's a phosphorus abyss and the phosphorus light was coming up and you, you, you could sm- I could smell it and I could see it. It's the, the use of those adjectives, the way that he uses them, just the pictures just come into your head and the claustrophobia, you feel the claustrophobia as well as he's getting further into this mountain or this cave or what, this cavern, whatever the bloody hell it was. It's getting smaller and smaller and he's on his hands and knees and you're thinking, well, what, what is this that he's crawling into? And then he has two, yeah. two options at the end. He's either going to fall into that phosphorus abyss or he can turn back and go the way he came, but there's a big gust of wind stopping him and he's kind of trapped there. Yeah, the, the Borderlands is a film I forgot to mention. Thank you for bringing that one up. That's definitely a Lovecraftian film. It's called Final Prayer in the US. If you don't can't find it over there. Yeah, the uh, under the pyramids, uh, the descriptions of a, of Cairo, a city had never been to, and then that transformed itself into this Harry Houdini alleged to be knocked on the top of the head and being pulled on the ground, and finds himself in this place where there's these ancient gods that are worshipped by the, uh, the the Egyptian pharaohs, who are still you know the. And he explains the whole, con- I mean, the 1920s, when the weird, he explains the whole concept of Ka, the, you know, the, the sort of like the, car- the, the Egyptian, you know, spiritual like concepts of Ka and stuff like that. And he'd never been there. He would never have been to these places. And yet he wrote remarkable, plausible things, you know, descriptions of them. You know, he never got, he was so poor, he never got to travel outside the United States. Which is kind of a sad thing, because he probably would have, you know, that would probably was one of his dreams. But, and I think that's why he created these alternative universes, because he know he would never get to visit them in real life. I mean, in the Mountains of Madness, his descriptions of the journey down to Antarctica is phenomenal. You know, the, the ship's logs coming down through Australia, this kind of thing, how the Dornier aircraft were assembled and disassembled. I mean, the attention to detail is fantastic. And then again, he, the, all the hieroglyphs and the things that went on that were so horrible, he couldn't, you know, he possibly couldn't mention them. And um, you can feel the ice cold winds of the Antarctic down there. You can see the vast, endless landscapes, you know. And he even mentions people like, you know, uh, Charles Fort and stuff like that, and this kind of thing. There's one book, uh, a short story called The Secret Brotherhood. I think it was a. One of the posthumous stories, like the Peabody Heritage, written by, like, it was a half-finished story, and then August Dell had finished it. And uh, they, they, he basically meets this cult of people who all look like uh, Edgar Allan Poe. You know, it's just fantastic, you know. So, you know, he never met Poe in real life, but this kind of, like, these tulpas tul- tul- kind of appear in Providence while he's out walking. And he actually says to one of them, you know, he says to this guy, he goes, uh, and it's just, what do you think about this, how ancient it was? He goes, are you familiar with the world, the work, the work of Charles Fort? And he goes, no. He, 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 he postulates that there are, are there planets, there are other civilizations, other people. And this, the character who's like this kind of like tulpa of Edgar Allan Poe, where you find that later, it's probably an alien. He goes, it is so. It is so. It's just brilliant. It's just absolutely brilliant. And you're walking along with these people. One of them looks like Edgar Allan Poe. One of them looks like uh, Lovecraft and a woman. And he's actually an alien giving secrets of who they are and where they came from. And you think this is written in the 1930s? It's unbelievable, you know? I think uh, with you talking about Lovecraft never having travelled to these places, I think he did. I think he travelled in his mind's eye, in his his consciousness. And I know you've travelled like that, talked about it before, and I have as well. I've gone to places I've never been to in the physical, but I've gone in my mind's eye when I've sat down and thought about it. And one in particular, if you put some Egyptian-style music on, or if I do, I can be easily transported to ancient Egypt in my mind's eye and see it crystal clear, but I've never been there. And I think that's how he did his travelling around the world to these places like Antarctica and um, the Arabic countries. And he may have even bumped into uh, the Mad Arab because he said he dreamt about 
yeah, he dreamt about him. And that's where he came from, from one of his dreams. Well, when he was a little boy, he, he converted to Islam for a while and he called himself Abdul al Hazred. You know, and then later on in life, he said, you might know that that's the name of my character within the Necronomicon cycle. So he, he probably met that character on some kind of astral plane and brought him mm -hmm. and his magic into manifestation. I also think that the people who say he didn't enjoy life, he he hated life, he didn't like it. I don't think I don't believe that's true. For one, not only because of his work, but he was into astronomy, uh, very big, very big time. And I don't think anybody who's into astronomy and looks at the night sky through telescopes and things hates life. I think they've got a fascination for life and want answers to life's big questions. So I don't believe that he didn't he didn't like life. No, that's that's a very easy stereotype to, to like put upon him. I I spoke to a guy at Necronomicon whose parents knew him, and they said he was just a perfectly nice, jovial character, very oh, lots of fun, and he would come over for Christmas and stuff like that. And it was just like a you wouldn't you know he was nothing like what the the persona that some people try to put across. There's actually pictures of him with people, and he's got a big smile on his face. Uh, he was he was kind of strange looking. He seemed to have some kind of deformity with his chin, and that may have affected his self confidence. Yes, you know, in public. Yeah, I think his mother used to pick up on that and tell him that he had a strange looking face, and I think that had quite an effect on him. He made him very self conscious because he'd said to his wife <coughs> Sonia that he didn't. It had an effect on him the way his mother brought him up and some of the things that she said to him. I mean, if you've got an overbite or an underbite or whatever it is, um, and then you've got your own mother pointing it out that you deformed and you've got a funny looking face, there's something wrong with you. That's got to have a psychological effect on the child. That That's not something that goes away. Yeah, and, and he may have dropped out of schools because of a psychosomatic thing of being um, afraid to be around the public. Okay, people judged him. And... Um, the childhood trauma and then again we're back to the inbreeding again that he believed that his deformities were caused by the the phillips family being inbred or the lovecraft family being inbred but, but overall i from what i read about him and through his work and through photographs that i've seen of him he he comes across as a very cordial man um he's actually very smiley in some of the photographs he's with friends he seems to be very jovial um, he preferred to <clears throat> write to friends rather than be in the company of friends. And I can get behind that. I, I I have a pen friend. I enjoy, I can open up much more if I'm writing in correspondence rather than sitting across the table talking. Um, he was a private man, but he opened himself up, I think, to a select few through his pen. He had a good sense of humour. Very gentlemanly. That was very important to him to be seen like a gentleman and to act like a gentleman. Um, and I think as a result of that, in the modern day, he gets accused of being far right, and they do what they can to try and cancel him. Um, but they, you can't cancel him because if you cancelled him, how many movies would be cancelled? Because how many people has he influenced? How many writers? Even the band Metallica. He's everywhere. He's in places that the people who haven't heard of him don't even realise. He's he's everywhere. He is he is like a cosmic horror entity. He's got his tentacles in everything. He. This is one of the great tragedies of his. Uh, the the people that are that behind Necronomicon and his stewardship and all that stuff, they're all left wing American wokey liberals, and it's almost mm -hmm. like. Uh, I'm like, what are these people who probably would hate him, who probably hate him, are the guardians of his work? They're the wrong kind of people to be there. There's actually a there's actually a Facebook group called Right Wing Lovecraft, and it's just for people who are not woke liberals to actually talk about his stuff, without having to be told every five minutes that you know this is offensive or that's offensive and whatever. So that 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 he, he, you know. It, He's left a legacy that's, that's, it's vital. It's, it's full of vitality. 
one thing that appeals to me about him the most um, is he was a bit of an outsider and a bit of a loner. And he appeals to those of us who are like that as well. So I'm a bit of an outsider. I'm not big on being in the midst of popular culture and things like that. He was a, he was a recluse with amazing with an amazing imagination, and I'd like to you know if I I'd like to think of myself as a recluse with a good imagination. It's a compliment, and that's why he appeals to me because on a physical level, that's how I feel I am as well. I'm a bit of a recluse, a bit of an outsider. I don't fit in really. Now, most people in the tribe are. So if you enjoyed tonight's uh, HP Lovecraft special, and uh, this focus special, and shame on you if you didn't, and would like to uh, get an insight into his work and a good introduction, I suggest uh, Michael Hulalembeck, I can never pronounce his name, HP Lovecraft, Against the World, Against Life, with the foreword by Stephen King. It it's a series of essays that were originally published in French, but it's really excellent introduction to the man, into his work, into how other writers see about him. The Stephen King introduction is actually very good, and uh, there's also a, a two stories. There's the Call of Cthulhu in full, and there's also the fantastic The Whisper in the Darkness, which I just spoke about and a biography, a bibliography, and a few other things like that. It's a quick, easy read, and uh, you, you can get it's quite easy to get. So, Michael Hulululubek, an impossible name, I think he might be Belgian, and H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, Against the World, Against Life, with the foreword by Stephen King. Highly recommend. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this month's epic Lovecraft special as much as we enjoyed making it for you. And if it inspires people to pick up his works and look at them with fresh eyes, look beyond the surface and have a new sense of appreciation, then our mission has been accomplished. And thank you for watching and please continue to like and share. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and also subscribe to Beyond Room 313 channel where you'll find Thomas's VONs so get yourself subscribed there as well so you don't miss anything. <laughs> and one last thing I want to bring up uh, before we finish tonight is the Hocus Focus book. It is at the final editing stage now and that will be ready for release very soon. And I know we keep saying this, but we are almost there for publication and it will be worth the wait. We can promise you that. So please reserve us a space on your bookshelves for our upcoming book. Uh, I, I'll be pumping out the Vons, and uh, so it's uh, it's look we're going into the spring with a spring in our step, forty in step. So uh, with that in mind, Sarah, what's to this week's for this month's forty in card? Right. So this week, this month's card um, is the Two of Swords. Now I'm not sure if we've had this before. Um, it does ring a bell, but it's the Two of Swords, and it shows a woman who's sitting down with two crossed swords held defensively across her chest. And that posture suggests that she's in a state of self-protection or defence with a need to guide herself against external influences or conflicting ideas, um, which are also shown by the turbulent waters and the partly submerged rocks that she's got her back turned to. So for now, it seems like she's withdrawn to a safe space, a secluded space for contemplation, either before or after a conflict. Now, the seat she's sitting on also looks hard and uncomfortable, and that is to signify the importance of taking the time needed for contemplation and not to linger too long in this state of trying to keep the peace, because at some point you have to put your foot down and stand up and speak up for yourself. Now, look at the way she's holding those two swords up again across her chest and it looks so uncomfortable and heavy so the sooner she takes action the sooner she can put those heavy swords down and release that defensive burden. Now the woman's blindfolded and that symbolizes a temporary suspension of sight so that she has to rely on her intuition or her third eye rather than external stimuli to guide her decision making and also notice the parted hair which is revealing her third eye and that confirms the importance of tapping into inner wisdom and intuition 
Now we can take that a step further with the card's association with the Tree of Life sphere, Chokma, which represents wisdom and insight. And the partly submerged rocks in the background show underlying issues that have not yet surfaced, but are nevertheless still present. And that hidden elements may also influence a decision at hand. Now, the sword, as we know, represents the realm of the mind and intellect. And the two swords show a situation in which the individual is struggling with conflicting thoughts or choices. A decision needs to be made with only two possible outcomes. A or B, but it does require careful consideration before proceeding. Now, the waxing moon on the right side of the card symbolises growth and progression, showing that through the decision making process that this lady is going through, the lady is in the phase of growth. Now, usually the two of swords refer to the need for contemplation and reflection before deciding. And it may indicate a period of stalemate or uncertainty during which it is important to take a step back and look at all the options before moving forward. The card is about trusting your intuition and inner wisdom, even in the face of conflicting information or external pressures. I guess a good colourful example of the Two of Swords on a global scale would be the decision of whether to go to the Britney Spears concert or not. I don't think there's a better card pictorially for that situation than this card. We had to trust our intuition and inner wisdom in the face of phenomenal conflicting information and horrible external pressures. But we sat in that place that this lady sat and we used our discernment and intuition to decide. And finally, the card can also suggest the need to address and confront conflicts or challenges head on rather than avoiding them. So at work, for example, you may have to cross swords with someone who's loud-mouthed and bolshy in the office, but don't be afraid of standing your ground and resolving the situation rather than letting it fester. Yeah, it's a gr- it's a card of the uh, moratorium and truce. That moment of pausing, thinking about it before you have a uh, reconciliation or not. It's it's a very good card to say. Look, hold on, just wait a second. Think about it. Think about it. You know, don't don't make don't jump into the action right now. It's also like what we, you used to say in the in the vlogs. Just wait. Just wait, and it, it is painful waiting sometimes. But it's like that song by Tom Petty: "The waiting is the hardest part." And hopefully, it's not too hard for the next focus. Focus. Good night, everybody.